Good evening and welcome to the November 19th, 2018 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Doreen, could you please call the roll? Corey Fellows? Here. Roger Bealey? Here. Nicholas McGee? Here. Richard DuPerry? Here. Rachel Hendrickson? Here. Robin Sanders? Here. Thank you. A couple quick housekeeping notes. Uh, first, item, item number 13 on the agenda, um, Valentine Development LLC Eastern Village subdivision has been tabled at the request of the applicant. Um, also, I'll just quickly note that as has been the case for a few of our rec recent meetings, we've got a pretty long agenda. Um, and we want to try and move through this as efficiently as we can. So just ask uh, the applicant teams, members of the board, and members of the public, um, when you have the opportunity to speak, to just try and be concise. Assume that we've read everything that's been submitted to us. And um, we will uh, get through this. We certainly don't want to leave anyone off. And we uh, cannot take up any new items after 1030. So that's just sort of a heads up or a, or a reminder, I guess. Um, next item on the agenda is approval of minutes from the October 29th meeting. So moved. Second. second. Okay, we have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Item number five I'm going to um, sort of temporarily table because our town planner, Jay Chase, was going to introduce that for us. He's wrapping up another meeting right now, so he should be with us within the next few minutes and we will get to that. Uh, but for the moment, we'll move on to agenda item number six. Uh, Magenta LLC requests a sketch plan review for 40 Hygus Parkway, assessor's map R50, lot R35. <coughs> Jamel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so currently, this is, an this is an undeveloped parcel uh, located along the Hygus Parkway, just north of the salt pump climbing gym. Um, it is in the Hygus Parkway zoning district. The applicant is in front of the board tonight for a sketch plan review uh, for a 10,000 square foot warehouse and office building uh, containing two rental units. <coughs> One issue that staff would like to raise is that warehousing is not a permitted use, principal use in the Hygus Parkway Zoning District. The users of the site will need to demonstrate that the principal use on the site is consistent with the allowed uses in the district. The applicant will need to dememonstrate to the board that the proposed warehousing use is truly the accessory activity to the otherwise permitted uses on site. And second, uh, staff would like to point out that since this property consists of five or more acres of land, the project will need to be reviewed as a planned development. Given that this project may include additional phases, the applicant is encouraged to include all phases in the planned development review process. So I have right now, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jamel. And I'll turn over to the applicant's representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Bushy with Stantec here on behalf of uh, Magenta LLC, Carrie Anderson, a uh, well-known developer here locally. And uh, Mr. Anderson has had the opportunity to purchase, as Jamal has outlined here, a six-acre parcel off the Hygus Parkway, basically on the south side of the parkway. It was formerly a main department of transportation property, long, linear piece that had uh, uh, almost several thousand feet of frontage here along Hygus, uh, relatively uh, not very deep. It's 200, 250 feet at its uh, deepest. We've got the ponds over here further south of that, the new residential development taking place uh, just to the west. The proposal includes uh, a number of buildings, and what we've supplied for you under the sketch plan, though, is an initial phase that would consist of a 10,000 square foot building with two units. Now, uh, Jamal's first comment here about the use piece, and we probably overstated that in our submission materials using the term warehousing, and that's certainly not uh, <coughs> expected to be the primary uh, use of these buildings. We want these to be compliant with the HIGAS zoning, and in particular, uh, to be business uh, professional type spaces. We would expect uh, the tenants, of which we don't have a specific tenant right now, but for the first building, that tenancy uh, will be really earmarked for a business that needs office space. They may need secondarily some amount of open 
for lack of a better term, warehouse space or operational area within the building. Hence, we provided an overhead door, uh, loading dock, and that type of thing. But we're expecting these to be uh, offices and businesses that are certainly compliant with, with what the objectives ultimately have been or are for the Higgins Parkway. So I don't want to understate that per se in our next submission to you folks. We'll certainly clarify that and provide you better background, but it's not the intent to be a, a warehouse per se that you have seen in some of the other zones like the industrial park zone and so forth uh, over on the other side of Route 1. It's expected to be a little bit higher uh, uh, intense use, certainly. <coughs> plan above here, though, does show you the uh, layout of a multiple building configuration. As I said, we've got a lot of frontage here, so we're uh, put, positioning these buildings basically uh, facing the street, not in any particular rant fashion other than just a long linear piece. It's uh, noteworthy. This site has one control of access opening today on HIGA, so that is a key parameter that we have to deal with. And that existing control of access is actually somewhat easterly here on the property. Uh, when you go by the site today off of Hygus, this would be the area that is uh, mostly an open field area. And where I'm pointing to here, uh, moving west, is the more heavily vegetated wooded area of the site. We have found that this area where that control of access was actually some type of uh, fill man-made land area with lesser quality uh, material. So basically, folks, probably the department uh, in building a road at some point in time, uh, excavated material out of there and then backfilled it with uh, not as high quality material, basically some clay and so forth. So that's not going to be as desirable an area for us to be positioning any buildings. Hence, we've arrived at a layout that puts uh, buildings more towards the westerly end. But to get started for the development, we are proposing just a single building identified here on the far westerly end to position this building here, which is the high ground of the property. We're going to need to change and modify the control of access location here along the Hygus Parkway. We need to continue to do some coordination, and you're going to be talking with the folks today or tonight uh, who are doing the development with the Downs opposite, and we need to continue some coordination and dialogue with them as to their expectation where their driveway will be aligned uh, off of Hygus. So we expect to, to continue to work with that. So what we may show you next in our next submission may show something different here. But ideally what we're trying to achieve is a 10,000 square foot building, a little under an acre of uh, impervious surface between the pavement and rooftop areas, and there's a purpose behind that, and that is to basically get slightly below uh, the full stormwater permit uh, requirements for DEP. Our developed area would be about an acre and a half, so we would qualify for a permit by rule under the stormwater regulations with DEP. We also will also have to meet the local standards here. We would fully expect we'll be designing this site to have a full stormwater management system. Right now, we're envisioning, because of the lay of the land, to be able to put something on the far westerly end here, uh, some type of bio retention cell, pretty common now that you're seeing. But there is a point that we'd like to discuss with you folks tonight to get your level of uh, either interest or acceptance for activity within the 25-foot buffer area. So the Hygis Parkway Zone has a 25-foot buffer setback from the right-of-way line. <clears throat> that located along here can either be a natural uh, wooded vegetation area or a landscaped area as it's defined in the, under the, the code. And we had shown on this drawing uh, the idea that there could be some stormwater management, something linear in fashion, along the frontage. And staff has made a comment about that buffering area needing to be in place. And we'd like to see the board's appetite for, or willingness, I should say, to accept, thing, to accept, some, accept something that might be a combination of the buffering landscaping treatments as well as the stormwater management areas in perhaps probably some swales or something like that, that would be uh, the traditional now uh, design form for filtering and, and so forth, rain gardens, that type of thing. So that's a question we can talk about uh, perhaps here in a moment. So again, we have a single driveway 
uh, accessing. We have two building pieces here with a 10,000 square foot building split down the middle, two 5,000 square foot spaces, parking off to the two sides. We do show some parking along the front, and that too is a, another element to discuss with the board to gauge your acceptance and willingness to have some amount of parking here. Given the nature of the site, we don't have a lot of depth, and we're trying to achieve a traditional footprint for the building, rectangular in shape, uh, but then also having loading docks and accessibility for larger vehicles towards the back. And that limits us to a certain extent for where we would place our parking. We also think that it's beneficial to have the parking to the sides because each of these units would have front access for either their customers and or their uh, staff and employees who might be occupying uh, the building. So that's how we've laid this out. We have uh, great access to utilities, as most of you might realize, for high guess there's a water line on our side of the road, south side of the road. There's also sanitary sewer uh, infrastructure uh, that's pretty robust in Hygis Parkway, and there's actually a sewer stub today off into the uh, north, or uh, excuse me, uh, north, yeah, northwest corner of the property. So that'll give us great access for uh, that utility. There's also uh, stubbed out facilities for underground power and communications and so forth. So feeling pretty good about all the utility connectivity to this parcel. Uh, in our upcoming submission, certainly we'll have to cover the topics of traffic and trip generation and that type of thing. We don't believe, at least in this initial phase of a 10,000 square foot building, that we'll be anywhere as near close to a uh, traffic movement permit, but uh, nonetheless, we need to provide trip generation and evidence on site distances, of which they are fine along Hygis Parkway and that type of thing, but we'll, uh, we'll cover those in our final submission. So I uh, have a building elevation here. And Carrie can talk a little bit if you have some questions about that. Typical metal clad building here, colors and uh, distinction showing uh, number of windows and, and uh, some accents here along the, the front. We would expect there'd be a couple of doors in this area in the middle with a split down the middle uh, for each unit area to the sides. This is the, the typical with one at grade overhead door and then an overhead door that would be in a little loading dock area uh, on the side of the building. We've got a single pitched roof front to back. We would expect, uh, I think one of the techniques we'll, imply, we'll uh, use will be uh, putting a drip edge uh, filtering strip at the back of the building for the water quality piece on the rooftop. And then the rest of the site would have uh, uh, management measures, hopefully being uh, the bio cells or anything like that. And again, I'd like to have some perhaps feedback from the board as to the willingness to be able to use the 25 foot buffer area along the frontage. Site lighting will be another piece that will provide uh, more information. It'll be a traditional you know, pole mounts and a few building mount lights. I've got Swaney Lighting here locally providing our lighting and photometric plan. They're well uh, versed with a uh, local standard, so we would expect we would have uh, probably LED type fixtures, uh, you know, the most modern type things, uh, probably tied into some dimmer systems within the building. Uh, and timing so we can keep light exposure to a minimum, but uh, yet meet the, the local requirements for that. So those are our key pieces here, knowing you have a full agenda. I'd love the opportunity to have some board feedback on a few of the questions I posed. Okay. Thank you. Someone down at this end want to start? Rick? Uh, sure. I, it's pretty complete for, um, for initial site plan. So, a couple of things you mentioned, the traffic study. Of course, the traffic study is going to take into account the use, I think. So um, right now, it's, it's you anticipate it's going to be warehouse with 1,000 with, uh, feet of office space. Is that what you think? That's what we had uh, outlined was that each 5,000 square foot you, uh, building area would have 1,000 square feet uh, for office, and then uh, the remainder of that interior space 
four thousand feet let's say could be uh, open area uh, with access to overhead doors so a small business uh, if it's a landscape uh, type operation something like that would be able to use that interior space for those purposes right. warehousing not specifically we're not envisioning there being rack storage in the buildings per se a straight warehouse right and, and I know it's early to define what you're going to use the space for but at, at some point when you do you know come back and, and we talk about that a little bit more you you know your track your parking your traffic study and all that kind of stuff I'll line up with that there um, other than that your submission looks pretty um, complete to me and it's nice to see someone using that area Haggis Parkway so right. I don't think they got any that's Thanks, good. Rick. Rachel? Yeah, um, I guess what makes me a little uneasy is the thought of having three buildings in a row um, that as we're looking at one building, what we're going to end up in the next few years perhaps considering is three other, is two other buildings that look the same so that the whole thing is harmonized and the amount of parking then that's connected to those three buildings. Um, I notice uh, on the plan that you have there, while you have parking in front for the first building, you don't have parking in front for the other two. Is that correct? Or are we going to have 72 parking spaces if you build out all three? No, that, that's correct. Uh, one of the consequences of uh, some initial geotech work that we did, we went and did some boring holes out there, and as I alluded to, that area on the east end of the site, that's the field area today. We thought we were going to be looking at four 10,000 square foot buildings uh, and we had a building positioned in that area and lo and behold, uh, unfortunately there's quite a bit of poorer material in basically what was probably a, uh, um, a dump area, not a dump for solid waste or anything like that, but just basically a bunch of clay uh, that was uh, put into uh, an old borrow hole. And so that doesn't really pose very good opportunity to put a building on it. So we decided to put three buildings, and the next two buildings, if they were to happen, ultimately we would be coming back to you folks, by the way, for that, because that would uh, then trigger uh, both the stormwater permit uh, as well as another local review. So that's why we're only really seeking uh, a single building review and hopefully site plan approval from you folks uh, over our next application submission. Ultimately, if things are successful and, and tenant interest seems very high, we'd be coming back for the next two buildings. But those two buildings are slightly larger. They're a little over 12,000 square foot because basically we're trying to maximize the amount of GLA, the amount of, of, of uh, square footage in buildings because, you know, there's economics involved. You have to put so much money into the infrastructure of building that out. So it's worthy of trying to get as much building space as we could uh, comfortably fit in there. So we made those two 12,000 square foot buildings that could happen in the future a little bit deeper, a little bit larger, uh, and that put all the parking to the sides on those two uh, buildings that you're looking at. So that's a little bit of the basis of how we got to that okay. layout. But, but are you considering having parking in the, you're not considering having parking in the front for the other two? Correct. Okay. Um, I looked at the uh, basic standards for Haggis Parkway uh, and under the B permitted uses, section 10, warehousing a wholesale distribution accessory to and located in the same building, et cetera, uh, provided that the floor area of the warehousing and or wholesale distribution does not exceed 50% of the floor area of the principal use. So as you go forward, I urge you to really think about that 50% as a maximum in terms of any of the warehousing, uh, and that it really be an accessory use. If, um, if I may, uh, I'm sorry to yeah. interject. I know I walked in late, but I, 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 um, <coughs> the language you just read has actually been struck from the ordinance, and that was the... It's what was given us to go by. Okay. Um, so we uh, apparently inadvertently gave you the... the old language, uh, within the last four to six months or so, um, there was a zoning proposal that came through Long Range Planning Committee that um, took a look at the warehousing standard and uh, really sort of identified that a lot of the type of uses, particularly sort of the more light industrial or maker space type uses, if you will, um, often actually have 
larger, um, their, their creative space may be smaller than their sort of warehousing area, but the, the principal activity is sort of that, is that um, creation, if you will. And so having sort of the um, hard number of a 50% was, uh, seemed to be an impediment to some proposals. And so the, the thought was to get away from prescribing the maximum amount of warehousing space Provided, of course, as you just sort of echoed, that the principal use is actually one of those st um, still um, uh, listed permitted uses uh, uh, in the ordinance. Okay, what you're referring to, did that come after the 10 4 17? Yep, it would have happened at some point in 18. Then the only thing the planning board has is incomplete, yeah. and I would request that you review yep. what we do have and ensure that we have up-to-date materials sure. because the 10417 says 50%. Yep. So that's, yep. that's maintained the in there, yep. and it's difficult for us to take a look and make decisions Certainly. based upon uh, incomplete information from the planning department. Mm -hmm. Understood. The, um, let me ask you, Jay, did the purpose and description of the standards, design standards, change? No, that would, the only change was the warehousing piece. Okay, and then what the design standards say uh, is that the, the standards are actually uh, intended to encourage a high quality of campus style landscape and architectural design, preservation of natural features, integration of pedestrian <coughs> circulation, and interconnection of open spaces and resource protection areas. And as, as you go along, um, you've addressed questions of the buffer. You've addressed questions of landscaping. And certainly, I'm going to be taking a look at a, a robust buffering area, uh, as well as uh, really, as I said, being just a little uneasy at the amount, at the amount ultimately proposed of impervious area along there. Um, I will also, as we go along, uh, be interested in seeing auto turn to see how you're actually going to handle some of those larger trucks or a fire truck. Because as I look at that now, I'm not clear how a fire truck can get in and get out of there. So that's something that as we go along, we're going to certainly I'm going to be taking a look at. I don't know if there's possibility for interconnection. Um, whether it's a pathway, walkway to the salt pump, um, and ultimately down to the other end of Hikus Parkway, but I would suggest that that's a good thing also to take a look at as you go forward. I think looking certainly to the west as well, given the density of residential that's under uh, construction, and I think that'll be a, an important piece for some a bit of connectivity. But I, I'd add the impervious area, even with our full build out, if we get to that, we're at about two and a half acres. Uh, out of the six acres. So we're about 40% and the standards say there's about 75% allowed within the mm -hmm. zone. So we've tried to temper that. Some of that is just really a function as well as the fact that there's some uh, poorer land area there to put anything on. But I also think as you go forward in terms of parking, um, we try not to allow the parking in the front and the, I would guess the best way to uh, approach that if you believe that that's absolutely what you need is to have a really robust landscaping plan that screens that parking. Thank you. Thanks. Robin? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think you brought up some really good points tonight, Steve, so I appreciate you bringing it to the planning board's attention. The first one is unsuitable soils. I know you've talked about um, the fact that there are some um, undesirables kind of thing that are left behind from from uh, it being a DOT lot or a lay down yard kind of a thing. So what would be the disposition of the unsuitable soils um, assuming that you know the bearing capacity of the building and foundation may not um, allow for some of those unsuitables that are there? Uh, the unsuitables are to the east end of the property mm -hmm. we're not doing any development there. Okay. So that's very important. That's the reason we've already done the geotech work out okay. there to find out what we had for, for good soils. Fortunately enough, as you get out of that area, that's the field area today, and into that wooded area, moving westerly, geez, it's, it's great. So as long as okay. a reason, kind of similar to how the ponds were created over the course of time, yeah. people excavated good material out of there for yeah. road building and, and the like.
like. So right. we've got uh, a reasonable pocket there of good material. So with that said, and knowing that you've done your uh, subsurface exploration and probably a little more work out there too, it looks like Owen Haskell's been out there doing some surveying. I think we need some more existing conditions to look at in mm -hmm. order to fully understand whether or not stormwater features going in the buffer, the 25 foot buffer is appropriate. Um, we'll be looking for things like what's the natural um, hydrology or what's the existing sort of drainage look like there? Is there a way that you can, knowing if you have a phase two or something like that, is can you share the storm water? How are you going to, where is the the highest, not the highest road, the crossroads um, sort of driveway coming out? Would there be opportunity there for, for sharing or, or storm water and the like kind of a thing? So I think um, I don't feel comfortable to talk about what tonight whether or not the, the stormwater management can go in the 25 foot buffer. I don't think it's off the table, Steve. I just think that we don't have enough information to really talk about it tonight. And I, I would like you know you to keep those things in mind um, that come straight, straight from the site plan review ordinance regarding stormwater management and maintaining you know the, the natural hydrology and features and making sure that there's not offsite impacts. My thought on the, that 25 foot buffer area understanding recognizing having been here enough before you folks yeah. uh, relative to a robust landscape piece. Mm -hmm. uh, but personally, I felt that there is an opportunity to do both okay. because the stormwater feature that we would put in there would be heavily vegetated itself, but it may not have trees per se. If you're doing a rain yeah. garden, that's right. going to have a lot of low yeah. shrubs and so forth. But then interspacing that with some nice trees and so forth Absolutely. could achieve a reasonably, Absolutely. I think, good effect. And you've been around the planning board long enough to know that my favorite stormwater BMP is a forested buffer, because they they bring you know the, an average tree soaks up so much you know of the stormwater right. that so if you can if you can do something really innovative like low impact uh, you know development technology kind of there more power to you Steve I, I really appreciate um, you bringing that in um, so with that said are you trying to potentially um, link into the crossroads uh, sort of access road that's coming out there. I haven't looked at it all, I guess, in, in big enough terms as far as like your locus is concerned and where the road's coming out. Yeah, and honestly, that's okay. still an open question okay. right now. I need to meet with Dan okay. more and right. understand exactly how that was all work, uh, okay. recognizing that I think we're probably both looking at changes to our control of access condition that sure. is currently out there. So we're both going to have to go to DOT yep. and to get that control of access changed. Key for us is the fact that we're still only looking at a single driveway because we only have one control of access today. We just would like to see it shifted. Okay. And um, I think one of the last things that I'll leave you with, um, and I hope that I address most of the comments that you said that you wanted the planning board to sort of give you some feedback on is wetlands, but I think I'd like to see that in the existing sort of conditions plan, what we have to work with and what we're talking about as we far as... We have the wetlands map, okay. and uh, they're probably not all that keen because we've kept our wetland impact down below 4,300 square great. feet purposely so to avoid yeah. any wetland Super. permitting. Okay, that's all I have, and good luck to you. Thanks, Robin. <coughs> Nick? Thank you. Um, so I, I would say as far as the um, getting a stormwater management type of functionality to inside that buffer. I'm definitely open to it. Um, if you're talking rain gardens and a swale, I'd, you know, I, I think I'd be interested in seeing what you proposed. As, as long as um, you know, there's that understanding that that Highest Parkway is supposed to be <coughs> nicely landscaped and buffered as, uh, as it was deemed in the section you know, to be an entryway to Scarborough. So I think you have to keep that in mind as you're going through that, uh, if you can incorporate some of the stuff you're talking about, I'm, I'm open to seeing that. Um, I think, in general, the architecture of the building is lacking. Um, I feel like it's it does have that warehouse feel, um, and you know I think 80% of the square footage going to be open potentially for type of a, an open space warehouse. I, I think that's is really kind of pushing the limits of what you would consider office space versus warehousing. And I know there are different functionalities, but um, how would you? How are you going to delineate that? Is there going to be a wall at the, you know, at some point between the two spaces that you are marking that way, or are you just leaving it open and whoever your tenant is is going to tell you what they need? Have a build a suit. I think there'll be some build a suit 
aspect to this and understanding when a tenant comes in. Right now we're showing basically a demising wall between you know a, an area that would be more fitted out as the office area uh, compared to the back of the building where the overhead doors are. So uh, we would expect if it was a tradesman or something like that would have the opportunity to drive in their vehicle into the space or otherwise. So. That's kind of what we're envisioning now, but I think you're right. Ultimately, it's all tenant driven, and if a tenant comes in and says, "Well, gosh, I could use 3,000 square feet," then that's great. We'll, you know, work with that. And certainly, that's that's the whole aspect of this. I think is um, hopefully now that Hygus is seeing more activity with the residential side of things, but that'll also be a bit of a driver on the business side and the business services that could uh, hopefully work well with what you're seeing out there. For, for development. Just, it seems to me, having been around here for a long time, that Hygus has had a certain goal and objective and dream of the of the residents here and hadn't really gotten there for quite a period of time. I mean, Cabela's anchored one end of it, certainly, but uh, beyond that, it's, it's not really taken off. But you have a lot of opportunity, obviously, now with the downs going ahead and with the residential pieces uh, going ahead, uh, great things are happening. So this is a, a nice little piece, I think, that can uh, mix with all of that hopefully very well. Could you um, put the front elevation up for me real quick? And I just kind of want to visualize if two tenants possibly there is the sign I know it's you know a rendering but is the signage on top of the building centered over two doors going to lend itself to two different you know two different companies doing <coughs> business there? Uh, and that, I think that probably goes to the larger architectural uh, point I'm making, which is, you know, would a little bit more separation there help with the, you know, it's it's kind of a monotone steel building. And point well taken. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that. So, yeah. um, outside of that, I think, um, I think I'm okay. I'll wait and see what the uh, next round brings. Thanks, Nick. Roger. Thanks. <clears throat> um, Basically, I think um, my colleagues have asked a lot of good questions. Um, and um, I, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. So just to the north is where the um, entrance to the residence at Gateway, the apartment complex is. Is that correct? Uh, to the west. Is it to the west? Yep. Okay. And uh, just south uh, or to the east, I guess, is the salt pump? Right. Okay. Um, and I will make sure that in our next submission I have maybe a better locus map that gives you uh, those defining pieces because you don't really see them in my drawings right now. I'll get the drawings for the other projects and kind of get those into a drawing so you can get a very good sense of where we're at relations-wise. Sure. Um, I, um, I have some real problems with the architecture of the building. Um, I think it would look good and it would be fine in the industrial park, but I really question whether that architecture fits on the parkway, and I know Kerry's pretty creative and has some good visionary, you know, vision, uh, visionary architectural aspects to most of the buildings he does in town. So I would expect to see something a little bit more different than what that is right there in the future. Um, but other than that, I, I think everything's pretty much been covered. Yeah. Thanks, Roger. I'm going to start with a question for staff, and I, I guess for you, Jay, and I, and. Obviously, I'm, I'm on the Long Range Planning Committee, and I do remember talking about this warehouse distinction and the fact that we've sort of shifted or the, the council ultimately um, elected to tweak that language so that it's more about functionality and, and the nature of the use as opposed to square footage. Um, but for the benefit of the board and others, could you talk maybe a little bit about um, what your expectation is or whether there have been discussions with others, with other town staff as to sort of how that's going to be enforced in theory? I mean, what, what, are, the, what are the metrics and what, how is that to be enforced or is it really more about how the planning board interprets things when proposals come forward? Yeah, no, I think um, we, haven't, we haven't sort of developed design matrix or, or um, sort of standards, if you will, for how it will be ultimately decided. I think um, as tenants come along through the planning board process, that'll certainly be reviewed. But over time, as we know, buildings change tenants and those sorts of things. So ultimately, it'll be on our zoning administrator to review 
sort of what are the permitted uses in the site and what is the um, what is the driving activity? Is it sort of a, a and um, I think one of the you know is it is it truly a warehousing space with a little bit of office um, that's really there to function mm -hmm. for the warehousing, or is the warehousing supporting the activity of, that's being produced mm -hmm. on site or or what have you? Um, so um, there is a bit of nuance to it, um, but I do think you know it. It's not too dissimilar to a discussion. I think um, I certainly, um, I think you were on the board at the time. I think it can think of creative imaging on Muzzy Road. I know we had a very similar mm -hmm. discussion around really what is that activity because they do have their warehousing space sort of is larger than their maker space. So they have mm -hmm. office space. They have sort of this maker area where they sort of put together their 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 wares. And then they do have a larger warehousing area yeah. because what they put together requires that. So, um, but obviously, functionally, when you're talking about space that's primarily warehousing, a lot I think a lot of what we're looking at or potentially concerned about is the the intensity of truck traffic track, track, and deliveries right. and things like that. So I think yeah. that's what that's uh -huh. really what what the town had in mind when it revisited that, and that that was within the context of continuing to. Um, continuing to adjust um, the expectations and the parameters for Haigas, understanding that, as the applicant noted, that vision has shifted over time, um, and the nature of how different businesses use certain types of spaces has changed as well. So I think it's been kind of a balancing act trying to adjust to that and make sure that the town is not missing out on potential uh, business that could locate along there um, while still maintaining an attractive kind of parkway landscape. So um, in terms of my thoughts on, you know, where we are with sketch plan at this point, I you know, mostly echo what my colleagues have said. Um, I'm open conceptually to having, um, to having some stormwater treatment within that buffer. Um, but I think, you know, as, as Ms. Saunders and others said, I think we kind of need to see what that, what that might look like. And I think it's fair to say that we would expect there to be some, some uh, solid buffering. Um, in terms of the architecture, I generally agree that, and understanding again, this is just sketch plan and this is just a, a schematic at this point. Um, I think I can kind of see what, what, what you're going for, but um, we can kind of continue to develop that. Um, and then again, landscaping will be important. Uh, we'll look forward to um, to seeing all the all the usual deliverables that come with the next phase, the traffic study, the photomet photometrics plan, and so forth, and landscaping as as mentioned. Um, is there anything else that you need from us in terms of feedback at this stage that you haven't heard? It's not. All right. Very good. I appreciate it. All right. well, well, thank you, thanks. and we'll look forward to the next one. All right, now that Mr. Chase is here, we will step back to item number five. The planning board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed amendments to chapter 405, the zoning ordinance, to amend section six, definitions, affordable housing. Yep, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So board members may recall this was before you a few months ago, and uh, at that time, planning board members had a lot of good questions about some of the language that was being proposed to be added and deleted. And um, as you'll recall, I had, had talked about how this was, um, and maybe I say this at the outset, this is an initiative coming from our housing alliance. Um, and so after the questions asked by, by the board, um, staff had an opportunity to go back and, and look at the language more closely that the alliance was being was proposing and it actually turned out that the language that had made it through first reading and, pub, and, and got to public hearing at the board wasn't actually our standards and our definitions. It was sort of a, it was a work in progress that came from the alliance um, and so some of the main concerns that came up from the board was about deletion of language around particularly around how do you uh, uh, ensure that the um, units would be remain affordable into the future, it was actually language that didn't currently exist. It was shown as being deleted, but it was, not, was an existing language. But the concern was still a, a, a good one. Um, staff thought so, and so brought, brought it back to the Housing Alliance, and, and they concurred. So what I think you'll see now is 
really there's uh, two sections of the ordinance that are being proposed to be amended. One is still section six, the definitions of affordable housing um, is really providing some uh, better clarity around around both home ownership and, uh, and um, rent or occupied housing units. But then I think what uh, planning board members were most interested in, um, at least previously, uh, the language is now being added into section 7C. This is the language in the zoning ordinance that really talks about uh, a residential density and affordable housing provisions. And um, there's, uh, there's now provision C proposed to be added about affordable housing certainty. And this is really about how um, someone will in the future certify that the, um, that the, that the unit will remain uh, in, in sort of affordable hands, if you will. So, um, so that was, this is now the language that is being brought forward to you based on further discussion by the, by the Housing Alliance and sort of started back at square one, if you will, went back to council for first reading and we re-engaged uh, the process. Um, so. All right. Thanks, Jay. So again, uh, this uh, is a public hearing. I will open it up for any public comment. If you do have anything to say, please come on up, introduce yourself, please keep your comments to five minutes or less. I will open the public hearing. Oh, I thought we had someone. <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty of seats up here, by the way. Um, any takers? All right, I will close the public hearing. And we will turn to board discussion. Any comments, questions? My only no? question is, is there someone from the planning board who's on the Housing Alliance? There's nothing I'm not aware of. So. Is there anyone from the Housing Alliance here, perchance? No. Okay. All right. Do we take the lack of comment as a general comfort with this language all right one quick question sure mm -hmm. just clarifying okay. uh, <clears throat> it's definitely better than the last edition we read um, what is MSA uh, it's metropolitan mm -hmm. statistical area thank you Corey. should that be it's outlined a, somewhere or is that well known and I just uh, could be. I'd be curious I mean we're, we're looking at just an excerpt so it's possible that it's defined okay. elsewhere okay. but that's a good a good point yeah. Just it's yeah. Okay, that was it actually. Part right. of the alphabet soup that we. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole nomenclature there. Um, my my only question, and I think these are these are definitely good revisions. Um, but my only question is, what is the uh, what is the consequence if someone is found to not be in compliance mm. with this? Uh, they would then be presumably found in violation of our ordinance, and we have sort of a whole section about violations and the procedure for fines and what have you. Um, what corrective measures would take? What? That's, I guess, a, we'd have to sure. figure that out with our, our town attorney and how, how we resolve the issue would right. be a matter for that time. Right. You could certainly ask the same question about a lot of potential violations of the ordinance, but... Mm -hmm. Um, but, it, but it would be covered by our vibe because right. this is in our right. zoning ordinance and within the zoning ordinance we do have a vibe, you know, a whole section around if you're found to be in violation, what the, what, okay. what happens, process is anyway. All right. One sure. quick question. Is there a reason the um, town manager is the designee rather than somebody from like the Housing Alliance or Code Enforcement? That's the person that seems to be certifying all of, uh, seems like a... Uh, our, Town manager has been working pretty closely with the Housing Alliance over the last number of years and really has um, sort of been their lead staff person. So I think that's been, that's the appropriate that, place for it. Was basically what was going yep, he, okay. He's on board with it. And he's uh, <laughs> all right. All right. That is it for me. So, great. Thanks. So I think it's fair to say that the board is good with this and that will be the opinion that we will put out. Thank you. Now jumping down to item seven, Mill Commons Development LLC requests a subdivision and site plan review for lot two of the Crossroads Plan Development District, phase one, assessor's map R52, lot four. Can you introduce this one, Jamal? Sure. 
as the board may recall, uh, this applicant did receive uh, preliminary subdivision approval uh, by the board for lot two of the phase one uh, plan development in August. Uh, the applicant is before the board tonight seeking a preliminary subdivision amendment and final subdivision and site plan approval. Given that the board has reviewed this project numerous times over the last half year or so, uh, staff is comfortable with this request, provided the, board's, the board finds that the review standards have been fully satisfied. Uh, so since the last board meeting in October, uh, the, the development team has met with the public works and engineering departments here in town and came to an agreement of, on the design of Mill Commons Drive as a public way to have a width of 24 feet of pavement and a curve radius of at least 75 feet at the two curves uh, within the development. Uh, the applicant is still requesting several waivers from the street acceptance ordinance design standards, uh, which staff is comfortable with. And I'll pitch it to Angela uh, for additional comments related to site design. That's what we have. Thanks, Jamal. Mm -hmm. I'll turn it over to Mr. Bacon. Uh, thank you very much. Dan Bacon with Goral Palmer Consulting here on behalf of MNR Holdings. Um, as introduced by, by staff, um, we've been at it for a while uh, around lot two, working on the design. And really, from the last meeting, the remaining issues that we understood were um, finalizing a, a street design that works for public works, for equipment, for operations, but also fits the goals of this neighborhood and being compact, having a, um, a grid layout and uh, streets that are designed for slower speeds. So I think we found that the right recipe um, with the 24 foot wide streets that meet the town standards, uh, slightly tighter corners um, at, the, at the two curves in the street um, and a few other waivers that I understand that um, public works and town staff are comfortable with. Um, one of them is the distance between the two intersections of these streets that interconnect with the Downs Road, um, the 75 foot center line radius, and then the, um, the pipe size for stormwater conveyance. Um, so, other than that, we uh, believe we've met the site plan and subdivision. Uh, design standards and requirements. And there are a few remaining issues that we've um, been working on since the last round of staff comments around easements for access to the stormwater elements and a few other plan notes. So uh, we think we're in, in good shape. We're happy to talk about um, the, the grading in that location. Our thinking had been um, that we provide that grading and then let that area revegetate and, and to come back into a, a buffer to the, to the wetlands there. Um, and we're happy to talk to the board about alternatives there. Um, we're interested in kind of meeting the, the needs for an approval this evening and um, we'd like to proceed from there. So I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'll start with you this time, Roger. Okay. Um, I actually, uh, I don't have any problem because, I, I, as I recall at the last meeting, the issue was the radii and the uh, width of the streets and everything, and I think they resolved that by meeting with the public works and the town engineer. Uh, so I, I support the waivers they're requesting. So I think we can move forward. All right, thanks. Nick? Thank you. Um, I'm in the same position as Roger here. I appreciate you guys working with the town to kind of <coughs> get on the same page on that. Um, and as far as, and I know, Angela, you mentioned that you were hoping the board could weigh in on that slope. Is, has there been any discussion regarding, you know, the concerns and possible solutions yet um, for that slope? Has that been brought up between the two parties? It's been designed this way um, 
for, I think, at preliminary plan and, and since the preliminary plan, there is a retaining wall that um, provides for principally the 75-foot buffer to that stream. So that's uh, the reason there's a retaining wall in the area is to maintain that larger buffer to the intermittent stream that Jamel's doing a great job of pointing out. Um, and then the retaining wall ends recognizing that there was grading providing um, really kind of the change in grade from the building locations down to the wetlands because there isn't the stream in that location. Um, we can look at continuing a retaining wall um, if that meets the staff and the planning board's needs. Um, I think that can be incorporated there and as opposed to a slope. Is that what you were looking for in general or? I'm not sure where we just landed there. <laughs> uh, the only one that might not, not, not following where the basic. Yep. We've maintained a 25 foot setback for buildings to the wetlands. We haven't maintained um, a 25 foot setback for some slopes in some locations. At this location, we're proposing a slope uh, within that buffer and planned on revegetating it so then it would go back to being natural. Um, but if it's a concern of the planning board that it not be grading um, in that area, then we can look at a retaining wall that can um, lessen that, that encroachment. I think that's where the town engineer's mm -hmm. going with it. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. I'll, I'll hold off editing this. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Robin? So if the, the retaining wall is there, what do we get for a setback, Dan? Any, anything is, I thought I heard Angela say you, you had pulled it back some from the wetland. We had. Okay, so are we gonna get any setback to yeah, the there retaining would be, wall? There would probably be a 20 to 25 foot setback, setback to the wetland edge. We, okay. had, we had the retaining wall more for the 75 foot back setback for the stream, yep. so there are two different features we're trying to buffer. Okay, yep. and what kind of, that seems, Appropriate because that's what kind of slope are we looking at there? If you do so keep one to that. one, so. yeah, one to one, which doesn't seem, yeah. So I, I guess the retaining wall. Oh, my, Drew, the design engineer says two to one. Yeah, and that was one of my concerns. I think we met with Drew today. Obviously, looking at it, um, and they label it two to one, which I was told was wrong as well. That that's three to one, and then it gets deeper, so it automatically and we put scale on it. You know, yep, so exactly. I So if we didn't, if we did ask you to, to you know, because you've gotten a lot of waiver, you're asking for a lot of waivers here from roads and things like that. So, so I think um, this to me is just another waiver. So I, I think, um, you know, if we were to set back from the wetland 25 feet, and if we were to go to a hundred foot radius and and ask that there be a 300 foot between the intersection, that's going to chew up your developable area. We get that, and and that's also going to chew into what you can make for a, a potential profit. So, um, so I guess at, at this point, I'm inclined to have a, you, to to agree with the engineer that a retaining wall seems appropriate, so that we don't get the creep into into the wetland type thing. Um, 
and, I, and I'm kind of with Nick on the, what's, the, I guess, why wouldn't you want a retaining wall there? I mean, it, it's well, safer, I mean, you, you know, it would be safer, I, I assume you'd have a fence at the top of it. What, what's the, why not? Yeah, we've been designing not retaining wall so far, given that uh, we aren't impacting wetlands with this design. Um, and there isn't an ordinance requirement for a 25 foot buffer. It's a, it's a, it's a policy or an expectation. So we wow. are comfortable with the retaining wall. We'd, okay. and we'd like to move, you know, we can work with a town engineer on a design solution that further um, buffers the wetland. I think that's where we're at at this point. And if I could just jump in a little out of turn, I think, you know, we, we do have a draft motion here if we get to that point and. It is um, in there. Well, we have that. a. It's part of it's part of the materials, and Jamel is sort of wordsmithing something, and I'm okay. hearing a willingness on the part of the applicant to work with okay. staff to come up with some reasonable solution. So I think we can, we should be able to craft something as a as an additional condition of approval if, if we get to that point. Good. Okay. Um, excellent. Thank you. Find my comments here. So, um, looking at the staff memo, and if, if you happen to have it with you, do. on page two of four, um, other elements to consider. Um, did we just did we just hit this uh, in the middle paragraph? Other elements for consideration: the property line follows a 25 foot setback. The property corner is within the wetland area, which is not typical and should be discussed by the board. Is that that same area? It's in the same location. It's Correct. in the same location. Yep. Okay, so we just made sure that we are 25 feet away from that. Yes, and we can. Okay. So we took care of that. All right, I'm really not trying to beat a dead horse. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just jump in then. Yep. Yep. Today, again, our meeting committee can speak to this. They actually modified that property line already. Okay. Right, so the wetland will be fully in the open space property versus the lot two property. Great. And then right below that, Dan, um, under site plan review elements, the last mm -hmm. sentence, the designer should consider providing a minimum of six feet along the entire berm to ensure that future maintenance and operations of the system can be provided. Did that get addressed at today's meeting as well? Way to go, Drew. <laughs> All right, um, and the easement was worked out as far as the stormwater, um, the underdrained soil filters are concerned. That Those will all be shown on the plan that great. will be signed by the board. Yep, and access to the spillways and the outfall locations. Um, so what about that catch basin then at the end of the gutter line that um, I think staff was worried about and as far as um, in winter months? It's my understanding is comfortable with the catch basin design. Okay, so there was a catch basin design? Oh, that is in the motion. Okay, thank you. Um, going down that page three, the applicant has indicated that they're basing the tighter street design on a 20 mile per hour speed limit. How do we enforce that? Will it be the police department's responsibility or will there be speed bumps? Or There's what? gonna be speed, li speed limit signage. Um, I mean, these aren't very long streets. There's, the straightaways aren't more than 250 feet, so I think it, okay. it's going to be probably hard to, um, you know, disobey the speed limit based on the design. But oh, that sounds like a challenge okay. for some people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> on the last page, Dan, the top, uh, the first sentence, yeah. um, could, um, is the existing conditions plan coming forward? Is that something that's also included that's in the? part of the motion. Perfect, mm -hmm. thank you. And um, how about the tip down detail, the ADA tip down detail? Did you guys talk about that? Drew's nodding his head, um, thank Drew's you. Yep. And um, how about placing an erosion control mat um, near uh, the grading duplex three and four on the erosion control plan? Drew's nodding his head also, so that looks good. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is um, uh, coming back to the waivers for the roadway on page two, which includes a minimum center line radius of 100 feet, I'm sorry, 75 feet versus 
100, and then the intersection separation distances. Can, can we understand, you know, the, I think the, um, the, the Public Works memo did a good job of saying that this is um, the intent of the decision is not to set a new precedent for the design standards here, but to find a balance between the access needs of the town for delivery of service and the desire to facilitate a denser neighborhood. I mean, I think that really sums it up incredibly well. I, I, I commend you all for working on it yeah. um, together. But it, it, it's, it's my opinion as a planning board member not to give waivers all the time. So I guess I'm just trying to understand that this is going to be the exception and not the rule. Um, well, I think it comes down to I think we worked well with Public Works on the design for this neighborhood. Um, there's a number of neighborhoods in the denser areas of towns that have gotten waivers for width, street width, um, but the conversation has been around width coupled with center line radius, the tightness of the, uh, the turns to ensure good operations for Public Works, but also the design goals of the neighborhood. So um, I think our our intention is for the next phase to work early on the layout um, mm -hmm. with Public Works to understand up front, okay, which waivers, if are there waivers needed, uh, which ones work or don't work so that we're not talking about final approval versus right. sketch plan. And I, and I think communicating proactively to whether or not the road is going to be offered for public acceptance or if it will be private, because I think that's where I got lost sure. was. Yeah. Originally it was supposed to be a private road, so if we can be really proactive about that and communicate that yeah. transparently, that would be fabulous. Thank you guys for your work with the town. Ms. Saunders, if I Thanks. may, or through the chair, sure. if I may, just uh, on the um, sort of street design parameters, I think as Mr. Bacon just did a good job of sort of, and you did too, sort of the, the notion of sort of the right away coming in and, and the need for that early communication. And we've actually already uh, started that with the next phase of development they're looking at. We actually called a meeting that had public safety, public works, sanitary districts. So we're, we're, we've sort of learned some lessons. And but where I really was actually headed with this, uh, with this little sidebar was um, one of the things I think that we've looked at as, as the various departments of the town is really recognizing that there is a, a little bit of a disconnect between some of our newer zoning um, desires and, and visions, if you will, and the street acceptance standards, which were probably written in the 80s when we were typically mm -hmm. a suburban strip mall type town. And, and really, how do we sort of marry these two things? And so I think it is a bit of a learning uh, process. And um, you know, I think, as you said, really that early communication is going to be key for us moving forward. So I thank you for bringing yeah. that up. Absolutely. And, and so is our future phases then, are they going to be public? Acceptance? The, all part of the all part of the, all part of the uh, okay. discussion that we're having. I think there, there's clearly going to be some public roads. I think they're looking at some alleyways. Um, okay. You know, and some. And that's definitely a point I'll bring up on yep. their planning board comments later in the evening. Sure. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Um, strangely enough, for me, I guess I don't have uh, much to comment on. Um, I do have one sort of note, and that is um, on S001, uh, in between building C and D, there's no sidewalk. And I know that that's planted very robustly, and, and the planting design looks good. But when I looked at the lighting design, well, it simply says lighting design, uh, lighting layout, site lighting layout. It looks as though there is a sidewalk, or was a sidewalk anticipated between building C and D. So I don't know whether that's left over from an old original plan, uh, it, but it, it's simply an inconsistency. So right. that, that you, is that is just, left over from the old plan in that um, part of creating a wider street is we needed to take impervious area out elsewhere. We're trying to minimize our runoff and our impervious area. Yep. So we added to the street and we removed a few sidewalks that we thought were the least um, critical for the site design. Yeah, I, I have no problem with it, but I noticed that it yep. wasn't it wasn't removed on on that page. And and in taking a look at what you've done with the landscaping in that area, it looks good. Uh, I'm generally quite pleased with the uh, the landscaping as it's come out with the garages, uh, with the site layout. I think this is a, a good 
good introduction to the whole um, to the whole community, the Great. folks coming in. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Great. Uh, I think you guys did a really good job. I appreciate all your efforts. I know you had to come back a few times for this, and I apologize for that. Um, I want to say that uh, on the 100-foot radius, um, I didn't really feel comfortable about making you guys be the first ones to adhere to that. Um, maybe not the first ones, but I know in the past we've allowed that. And so I appreciate you working with the engineer and the town on that. Um, and the last comment I'll have, I, your, uh, the way that you guys put together these submittals, it saves, saves me a ton of time going back and forth, um, especially on the comment pages. So, but that's all I have, uh, especially where it's 8 o'clock and we've only gotten through two. A lot of people waiting, so that's all I'll say. All right. You guys did a really good job. Thanks, Rick. And I won't belabor that too much more. Um, I do appreciate the applicant's willingness to take a little bit more time and, and coordinate with staff, and certainly thank staff as well and, and DPW for, for weighing in on that. And um, I'll agree with Ms. Saunders that you know it's it's helpful to have that full rationale articulated in, in their in their letter, um, acknowledging that we, as you pointed out in the last meeting, Dan, that there's some kind of competing objectives here in terms of placemaking and, and some of the other things. And as Jay pointed out, there are going to be, there are going to be some times when things aren't quite in sync. So I think, you know, the process has worked pretty well, all things considered. Um, I'm fine with the requested waivers. Um, as noted before, um, we're kind of uh, inserting an additional condition into this uh, motion for approval that addresses, hopefully addresses the uh, the grading issue, mm -hmm. the, that one corner of the property that was discussed earlier. And um, again, I know, um, you know there was some disappointment we didn't get to preliminary approval last time, but um, I think we're able to sort of go right to final approval for this now. Um, and on that note, I will uh, put the motion forward. I move to approve the final subdivision and site plan projected project titled Scarborough Downs <coughs> Plan Development Lot 2 proposed by Mill Commons Development LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Goral Palmer, dated November 5th, 2018, with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Uh, findings as stated, I won't read them, but they will be part of the record. Uh, three waivers. The first, permit the proposed centerline radius of 75 feet for Mill Commons Drive. Number two, permit the proposed intersection separation distance of 258 feet. Number three, permit the proposed storm drain infrastructure within the Mill Commons Drive right-of-way at 12 inches in diameter. Uh, the conditions, number one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan set shall be revised to include A, an existing conditions plan that includes the lots as approved for the overall subdivision plan for the phase one plan development. B, update the right-of-way line at the intersection located at STA 60 plus 30, left as identified in the staff review comments memorandum dated November 19th, 2018. C, address the stormwater management comments as identified in the staff review comments memorandum dated November, November 19th, 2018. D, regrade the berm adjacent to biocell number eight to be a minimum of eight feet in width. E, a plan notation indicating that Mill Common Drive speed limit is to be 20 miles per hour. F, the addition of speed limit sign locations on the final site plan. G, a modified ADA tip-down detail that identifies the use at all pedestrian crossings at roadways only. H, a detail for the ADS warning plates and provide the locations on the final site plan. <coughs> I, the addition of crosswalk signs ahead of the proposed pedestrian crossings on the final site plan. And J, this would be the, the new one. 1J, coordinate with the town engineer on revising the grading and site design located northeast of Building A as discussed during board deliberations. Um, can we actually mention a retaining wall there? My thought was we would leave that to mm -hmm. the applicant and staff to work out and, and not sort of overly prescribe that. Um, okay. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. 
Condition number two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the affordable housing covenant shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Number three, prior to the issuance of a sign permit, the applicant shall submit a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Number four, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall provide approval from the Scarborough Sanitary District. Number five, Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay a recreation contribution fee in the amount of $500 per unit. Number six, prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall survey foundation locations and other structural elements that are proposed to be in close proximity of the right of way. And number seven, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. Have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Should that be unanimous? Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Item number eight Hospice of Southern Maine requests a master plan review for 11 Lincoln Avenue, Assessor's Map R62, Lot 29B. Jamal? Thank you, Mr. Chair. As the board may recall, this Parcel is located in the B3 zoning district, uh, located sort of kidney corner behind the Holy Donut property along Route 1 in Lincoln Avenue. Uh, so the applicant was last in front of the board in September for a site inventory and analysis and master plan review. Uh, following the board meeting, the development team and staff met to discuss the merits of providing a full access drive uh, off of Route 1, uh, given the site plan standards seek to have uh, have the board require access be provided off of Lincoln Avenue. As requested by the board, the applicant has provide, provided a detailed traffic study that seeks to address the board's and staff's comments, concerns about the proposed full access off of Route 1. And should the board be inclined to permit access off of Route 1, staff would support uh, limiting the access to ingress only, as stated in the traffic peer review memo. I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Jamel. And I will turn over to the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board. I uh, just wanted to briefly recap some of the elements of the previous meeting since it has been two meetings since we were here. Um, and there were a couple of questions that came up towards the end of that meeting when we were having a discussion which chiefly related to the access to the site. Uh, one of those was, was what the performance standard meant in terms of the ordinance requirement and whether the planning board actually had the jurisdiction to waive it. Um, it's interesting to hear the discussion on the previous project uh, regarding waivers uh, because it is a performance standard that can be waived by the planning board, that requirement for access off the minor street. You'll see in our response to comments, we've actually uh, quoted the part of the standard that clarifies that for the board. And hopefully, if you don't have any more questions on that, I'll move along. But the board does have the ability to waive that requirement. Um, and that requirement does relate to, and it, it was the, the subject of most of the discussion at the last meeting, um, and as Jamal uh, correctly stated, it says where a site has frontage on two or more streets, the planning board will require that access to the site be provided off the street where there is the lesser potential for traffic congestion and for hazards to traffic and pedestrians. Importantly, it does go on to say, for developments with significant traffic volumes of 50 or more peak trips, Planning Board will consider access to more than one street, providing a traffic study clearly demonstrates a traffic safety and congestion benefit will result. Um, following that meeting, or at the end of that meeting, we were given pretty good direction by the board um, to, go, to go back to the drawing board, as it were, with that analysis. And much as we went rather at length at the last meeting, explaining in narrative terms about how we felt that a second access was justified, we were given the clear direction to go away and do an analysis based on the facts. Um, and Bill Bray has done that, and you'll see that in your submission. Um, we did also meet with, with town staff and the peer review traffic engineer prior to completing that analysis. Uh, we also requested a second meeting after we submitted it uh, thinking that that might be constructive, but I think uh, that folks just kind of ran out of time. So, so we certainly had the time at our end, and we made the effort to make that, that second meeting happen to discuss those findings. Um, 
So the ordinance sets three standards. We have submitted a traffic analysis and we are confident that we meet the three standards that are quoted in, that, uh, in the performance criteria. And that is that the, the project will in fact generate more than 50 peak trips. Uh, and there is a safety and congestion benefit provided by having that second access on Route 1. Uh, before I hand it to hand it over to Bill here to go through in, in depth that analysis uh, that he's done, we did also respond to the other staff comments. We were asked to respond to all of the staff comments, even, even though some of them were kind of superseded by that traffic analysis. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, there, was, there were a couple that were pertinent. I think the planning board at the end of the last meeting was comfortable with a response to the uh, active street frontage, frontage comment. Um, but if there are any questions on any of those comments or any of the responses to those comments, we of course would be happy to answer them. And I'll hand it over to Bill now because I know the majority yeah. of the discussion is going to relate. And I'll to just access. say briefly, and, and I don't think we need to go into a ton of detail on the traffic study. Again, we can, we can assume or expect that we've, that we've reviewed everything, but we certainly welcome a uh, recap and, and, the, and the highlights. Sure. Thanks. Good evening, uh, Bill Bray with Traffic Solutions. Um, I will try to keep my comments um, to a minimum as best I can. Um, we did complete a full traffic assessment as requested by the board uh, for the uh, proposed HSM project. Uh, there were three components of the study. It included uh, estimating the site trip generation uh, both for the morning and the afternoon peak time periods. We conducted a full safety audit of both the Route 1 uh, Haggis Parkway intersection and the segment of Route 1 between the Haggis Parkway and Willowdale Road. And then finally, we evaluated three uh, possible site access options and the impact on congestion at the uh, signalized intersection of Route 1 in Haggis Parkway. The, the first component, uh, estimating the peak generation for the site, um, we prepared it for two variables, building size of 14,500 square feet and number of employees, which was 47 employees, four additional employees over existing levels. The trip estimates were based upon the established procedures described in the ITE trip generation publication. The process fully conforms with the methodology presented in that ITE trip generation publication. And I will quote from the uh, publication, when trip generation data plot contains more than 20 data points and a regression curve and equation are provided use of the regression equation is recommended for estimating the trip generation of the project. Again, each of those conditions were met. Uh, we have developed the trip estimates. The site will generate an average of 44 trips in the morning peak hour and an average of 56 trips in the afternoon peak hour. Again, the town standard uh, is 50 trips. Um, we have met that with total of 56 trips during the evening peak hour. The next component of the uh, assessment was conducting a full safety audit of this intersection of Route 1 and Haggis Parkway and the road section between Haggis Parkway and Willowdale Road. Main DOT was contacted. They provided the latest crash reports for uh, the area uh, the years 2015 through 17. MDOT's report shows that the Haggis Route 1 intersection experienced a total of 26 vehicle crashes over a three-year time period. The corresponding critical rate factor was 0 0.80. Main DOT's report for the section of Route 1 between the two signalized intersections shows a total of 12 accidents occurred 
and a corresponding critical rate factor of 0 0.58. We drilled down into the details a little bit more and prepared vehicle collision diagrams for each of the vehicle crashes. 12 of the 26 accidents happening at the highest signalized intersection occurred on the west approach of Route 1. Five additional accidents occurred on the eastbound approach of Route 1. And another factor that was gleaned from the actual police reports, approximately 35% of the 26 crashes occurred either during the morning peak hour or the afternoon peak commuter hours. Seven of the 12 crashes that occurred in the roadway section uh, were rear-end accidents. There was a single left turn exit accident that happened with a motorist leaving one of the driveways uh, abutting Route 1 and being struck by a through vehicle on US Route 1. All of the remaining accidents uh, were unrelated to left turn entry or exit movements uh, through the roadway section. Just for information purposes, there are 13 plus driveways uh, in that section of road. And finally, uh, a Route 1 access that, allow, that allows left turn entry and, uh, exit right, and a right turn exit movement potentially intercepts more than 30 site trips in the morning peak hour and 37 trips in the afternoon peak hour from traveling through the highest uh, Route 1 signalized intersection. The conclusion on this portion of the traffic assessment, the traffic safety audit, shows a clear safety benefit is realized with any reduction of added traffic on the westbound approach of US Route 1. Again, a Route 1 entrance would limit uh, the added traffic passing through the intersection by more than 60% of the estimated total trips. And then the second benefit uh, experienced through the, on the road segment is that the section of Route 1 between the Haigas and Willowdale Road is a five lane section of highway that was purposely constructed by the Maine Department of Transportation, providing a center two-way left turn lane specifically to permit left turn entry and left turn exit movements from all abutting properties. The results of their safety audit for that road section shows that the uh, constructed improvements uh, certainly uh, provide a safe environment for people turning in and out of the numerous driveways on that segment without impacting through traffic uh, along the corridor. The next and final component of the traffic assessment involved looking at three possible site access options. Option one would include a full access on Lincoln Avenue and a partial uh, entrance on US Route 1 with both the left entry and right entry movements allowed and a right exit movement allowed. Option two proposes, again, the same Lincoln Avenue entrance, a full service entrance, and an entrance only driveway out on US Route 1. Option three proposes a full entrance only on the Lincoln Avenue uh, side of the site. <coughs> Separate capacity analysis were performed for each of the three access options and a pre-development travel condition to compare the overall traffic impact of the intersection for each travel condition. The mobility an analysis was completed using both the synchro and sim traffic computer models, a standard practice accepted in the state of Maine. Highlights of the analysis, option one, increases overall intersection delay by three seconds in the morning peak hour and there is no change in the level of delay at the intersection in the afternoon peak hour. Option two, increases overall intersection delay by two seconds in the morning peak hour and five seconds in the afternoon peak hour. And then option three, the, the option that 
only provides a Lincoln Avenue uh, entrance, increases overall, overall intersection delay by four seconds in the morning peak hour and five seconds in the afternoon peak hour. The results of the congestion assessment shows option three, which provides only a Lincoln Avenue entrance, increases overall intersection delay by more than 10% when compared to the existing uh, no build and the option one uh, design. Clearly, a Route 1 entrance provides a positive benefit to congestion at the U.S. Route 1 Highest Parkway intersection. I just have a few summary comments and then I'll wrap up. The town site plan ordinance, uh, and I will not repeat it again as uh, Mr. Johnson previously quoted, uh, provides three criteria that must be met for the planning board to consider uh, a second access onto the major arterial. Uh, we feel that we have documented that each of those criteria have been satisfied. Uh, we exceed the 50 uh, vehicle threshold uh, during the PM peak hour of 57 trips. Uh, there is clearly a safety benefit to having a access out onto Route 1, albeit that access being uh, somewhat limited. And it is certainly a congestion benefit by reducing the amount of new or added site trips passing through the intersection. I think the only other comment I would like to make is that the road section of US Route 1 fronting the proposed HSM site, again, which was constructed specifically to provide access for full access into all abutting properties, was done so by MDOT uh, to minimize and reduce crashes through that corridor. And again, uh, the review of their most current road safety audit certainly shows that that has occurred. There has been a single left turn crash occurring within that section uh, over the last three years, three years. Again, there are 13 plus driveway entrances and this segment of road is approximately a half mile in length. And then finally, option three, which again only provides a Lincoln Avenue access to the site has the greatest impact on traffic operations at the Route 1 highest intersection. It actually increases the overall congestion level at the intersection by approximately 10% uh, in the PM peak hour. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to ask uh, uh, Andy to come up and make some a few closing remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. I think Bill has summarized all his information on I'm hoping that you've all been able to take that in. Um, I think there were very few other items that were up in the air from our last meeting, but if there are any questions on any of those, then feel free to fire away, and, and at that, I'll hand it back to the board. All right, thank you. Nick, you want to kick us off? Sure. So having um, looked at the information that's been provided, and then um, more specifically the peer review, comments from Coral Palmer. Um, I, you know, this, this kind of kills me a little. I, I think this is a, a great plan, a, a, you know, a project I want to see happen here in Scarborough. I do not believe you've met the threshold to have any egress or ingress on, from Route 1. And that's my opinion. Um, and I think uh, the Coral Palmer document kind of backs me up on that. Um, and that's why I said this, this kills me a little, because this is a great project. I have no other problems with anything you propose there other than that Route 1 entry access point. Um, and I, I just want to, sh you know, for those that don't have the peer review um, comments in front of them, I do want to just share one of the lines in there. And I think it's important to um, really shaping how I feel. I mean, I think it summarizes it fairly well. And I, I think if I... You know, if this board disagrees with my assessment that um, entry access or egress should not be allowed on Route 1, I would, I would concur with Goral Palmer that there's at least a, some sort of restriction that the rest of this board would consider um, if, they, if there is approval in that direction. But um, the conclusion, their conclusion statement is 
It's our opinion that the applicant has not provided sufficient documentation and supporting evidence that supports providing a full movement access onto Route 1. With that said, our most significant concern is the left turn movement out of the site, which is not being proposed by the applicant. We do have concern with the applicant's preferred option that allows a right turn egress movement. Given the wide width of Route 1 at that location, the right turn movement cannot be restricted enough to prevent them from making left turn movements. If the town allows access onto Route 1, we recommend that it be restricted to ingress only and not allow any egress movements. We also recommend that if an access of any form be permitted, that the section of Route 1 be monitored the year after opening if three or more crashes associated with this access occurs, the driveway be closed in a permanent fashion. So my only comments on this project, other than I really, you know, it kills me. I, I'm not supportive in its current state. And I think that's relatively clear as we've gone through this process. Um, but that conclusion paragraph from the peer reviewer really sums up kind of my feelings on this. If, if you do have, um, if you do go forward from here from a board vote, my only request to this board is that we would put some sort of limiting fashion on a uh, monitoring program for something um, for that access point. That's, that summarizes all of it for me. Thanks. Thank you. Now, are you, and not to put you on the spot necessarily, although I guess I kind of am, um, are, you, are you suggesting that you would be open to a condition or a limitation for ingress only? If there is Route One access, um, my preference is to not have a curb cut there. I mean that, and I know there is an existing curb cut, an old, overgrown one that exists there. Um, yeah, I still, I still kind of feel strongly, and I think the zoning ordinance states specifically that 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 access point really should be on that secondary road, and and I kind of that's where I'm leading. If you know, can I live with an ingress? only. I think he's going to have to reconfigure that parking. I don't, I don't know how you shape that. Maybe, I, maybe it's an easy fix, but I'm not sure how you shape what we see there into an ingress only. He might have to move some of the parking and building around a little bit on the site. You'd have to tell me, but I don't even know if you've played with that option. Right now, I'm, I don't think I'm at the point to, to say yes to that. I'd, I'd want to see it. And then I would also ask that restrictions be placed if it was even an ingress only. All right. Thank you. Roger? Uh, <clears throat> I've, um, I would tend to disagree with Nick a little bit. I've um, been a proponent of allowing access onto Route 1 right there because of the two-way left turn lane. I think that's why it was designed for that express purpose. Mm -hmm. But I see what's happening here is that as I understand it, I think you're preferring, you're proposing option one maybe, where you're going to allow, you know, entry, both, you know, right and left entry into the into the site, but only right out. That's correct. Entry, and anybody heading south will have to go out through Lincoln. That's correct. Um, and it, I'm kind of curious. The um, the reason no left turn going out, is it because it's too close to the well, intersection? It's a, and it's actually well stated in the peer review uh, comments. That is, the, uh, and as Nick McGee just, just quoted there, that is the one turning movement that there is a concern with. There has been, as Bill stated, there's been one single turning accident coming out of a site on that whole stretch of Route 1 in three years, and it was a left turn out. And that is, you know, the, the typically the most dangerous movement out. You'll see the, the type of configuration we're talking about is actually, it's in operation right now, Bessie Square. So Bessie Square, as well as having the, the entry off the light, off the road that's right opposite, it has a full access entry off Route 1 and a right turn out off Route 1. So that's the kind of configuration that, that we would optimally like to see on the site. We think it, it Really, as, as Bill has said, it shows a significant safety benefit because you're actually putting less traffic through the intersection, which is significantly more dangerous than that whole segment of Route 1. So, you know, the, the numbers will tell you there's a, there's a safety benefit. And even in Goral Palmer's peer review uh, comments, they actually address that and say, 
well, it, may, it doesn't look like it's very significant. And, and it's the same with the, and there may be an anomaly in, in the crash numbers in 2015. So there's not, there's not direct contradictory evidence to suggest that that is not the case. And similarly with the congestion benefit, that there's a question as to how significant that congestion benefit is, which is drawn up in the peer review comments, and it says it's only a difference of four seconds. Well, the, the ordinance doesn't say it has to be a significant benefit. The ordinance says, is there a congestion benefit? What the numbers say and what the facts say is there's a congestion benefit, there's a safety benefit, and as Bill said, we create more than 50 trips in a peak hour. So it's, it's clear to me that we meet all of those standards. Um, the, I mean, I, I can go along with um, supporting option one. The only uh, question I would have for you is, would that be confusing to your um, your clients or patients or whatever you call them, <laughs> people who are coming into your site when they want to leave? Um, they see If they want to head north, they could see that they could head out. But if they have to go south, they have to go in a different way. And, and that's, a sign, that's a signage issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot easier to control that movement once people are on the site than it is to control people trying to get in when they can't get in. So at that point, it, it may become, if people are confused, it may become a congestion deficit in the parking lot. But that's not causing any safety issues to anybody. No, no, I understand. Somebody may hesitate on the way out, see the sign and say, oh, I can't go left. There's a sign that says go to the rear of the parking lot to, to exit south. So the worst you're going to get is somebody stuck around that entrance thinking, oh, I've got to turn around and go back down the other, down the other way. It's not. The, it, it's certainly not the same as somebody driving by the site looking for an entrance and saying, "Oh, there's not an entrance there. Where do I go now?" Which is the argument that we were making before about the safety problems on Route One of not having an entrance. I, I think one of your earlier arguments was that you wanted to have access and visibility on Route One. Yes. Um, I'm just saying that I think once they're in, it might be easier and cleaner for everybody to know that the exit. They go a certain way, and that certain way would be out Lincoln. That's that's the only thought I had on that. Yeah, but, and we can certainly talk about that. But you know, the, the preference would be, you know, it, it's easier to get out onto Route One, turning, going north. It's it's kind of right there, and people who come in would have that expectation, and then you can sign them to go the other way. Yeah, basically, it's a, it's the same thing with Holy Donuts. You can you can right. go out on the right, but Many people will just go back out and go to the intersection, you know. So, right. um, that, that's this is the only issue as far as I can tell. So, I'm all set. <laughs> I'll wait to hear what everybody else has to all say. Right. Thanks, Roger. Robin. Um, so I guess I have two things to say. One is, um, I guess I'm the stickler for no waivers on the planning board kind of a thing. Um, that's that's well known. Uh, number two, I've been in the Holy Donuts. <laughs> trying to go out of their egress only, and somebody's tried to come in at me. Mm -hmm. And in the safety world, we, we deal with things <coughs> called near misses, and that to me was a near miss. And just because it doesn't, it doesn't show up in an in a accident count, it was pretty close, and so it was pretty scary. So um, I'm not going to belabor the point and just say that I think we have to go to Lincoln Ave. So my apologies. I, I very much support the work that you all do and, and uh, wish you well and good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Rachel? Yeah, we, we have two very well-qualified uh, folks uh, providing us with information and traffic analysis. I, and they both took a great deal of care uh, and a great deal of professionalism and came up with different opinions. Um, I that then puts me back to what the, uh, what the ordinances say, and I do not believe the case has been made for an entrance or exit on Route 1. I think we stay with Lincoln. Thank you. Thank you. Rick? <coughs> yeah. Um, I looked at the studies, I looked at the ordinance, and I'm still in favor of the Route 1 entrance and exit. And it's, it really comes down, to me, it comes down to safety, and, I, and I'm looking at everything. And 
no matter what the ordinance says or what the traffic s studies say, it's, it's, you know, sometimes you got to look at things with common sense. And to me, it makes common sense to have that, that driveway. Um, you're going to have people turning around in the bowling alley. It's, it's going to happen. It's not a, you're setting it up. I, I think if we don't have that driveway, um, two things may happen. One, this whole project may go away, which is bad for the town of Scarborough. And two, you're going to have people turning around in a parking lot that on Saturdays and Sundays is pretty full of pedestrians. And, and yeah, they shouldn't do it, but they're going to do it. Um, so, you know, we talk about what the ordinance says, if it was a corner lot, then yeah, I'm, I'm fully in favor of having just one entrance off the side street, but it's not a corner lot, it's a hospice. You're gonna have people that are going there that aren't really thinking about mm -hmm. what they're doing and they're gonna pass it and they're gonna turn around at their first opportunity. And, and I, I think that to this very day now, if they go ahead and they build this with that one driveway and someone gets killed in the bowling alley, at, at least I will know that I've said my thoughts. Um, traffic studies, ordinances, um, I think from common sense point standpoint, that driveway makes sense and it's safer. So that's all I have. Thanks, Rick. So as others have mentioned, this is, this is difficult and we have these situations periodically where we have, you know, uh, as Rachel said, um, two very well qualified experts who are coming to maybe using slightly different methodologies and coming to, coming to different conclusions. Um, and it is true that this board does entertain and sometimes grant waivers um, in, in a variety of contexts. Um, I think the bar is generally highest when we're talking about public s safety. And, and I've mentioned this before, but in my 10 plus years on the board, this is my second to last meeting, not that I'm counting or anything. Uh, it, in my 10 plus years on the board, I think there's only one time that this board has actually taken a vote and denied, to actually den and to deny an applicant. And it was also on Route 1, and it was a retail establishment, and it was out of a concern on public safety. And we had, it was a similar, somewhat similar situation in which we had, we had some experts telling us this was okay. We had DOT saying that it's maybe okay. But, um, you know, there was a, a lot of concern about, about safety, and that really ended up uh, kind of trumping things. I personally think I might be able to get to uh, some sort of a, a limited movement involving Route 1 as suggested in the, in ultimately suggested in the Goral Palmer memo. Um, but just, you know, counting votes here, <laughs> so to speak, you know, of, of our voting members, there are three who seem pretty, pretty adamant that they are not willing to support that. Um, and so I, I don't know that there's much more we can really uh, say about it at this point other than there seems to be a, a, you know, a majority on this board that is not comfortable with Route 1 access. And we do have a signalized uh, intersection that's available. And then I, I think if, if you would allow us, we will table this application. Um, you may be able to see what's coming down the line here because I think one of the one of the topics that came up at the last meeting, I think uh, Mr. Beely mentioned it, that, that this site is almost being handicapped at this point by having frontage on Lincoln Avenue. And if they didn't have frontage on Lincoln Avenue, frankly, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. Um, so that may be something that the applicant has to consider as to as to whether the property still needs to have or continues to have frontage on Lincoln Avenue, which is, I mean, it's a shame to talk about a, a property being being devalued by having extra land on a second street, but that that may be something that we have to consider in the future, and that's 
that's unfortunate. It's unfortunate for the process. It's unfortunate for the applicant. But I think at this stage we have to table the project and come back with something that looks different um, if it comes back. But we thank you for your time right. and consideration. Right. We Thanks. thank you for your, your understanding and going through the process. Thank you. been at this for almost two hours and we have a ways to go here so I'm going to uh, call a brief recess I'd like to start promptly again in about five minutes thanks I have it yes yep. yeah I'll show you tomorrow yep
materials in response to those review comments in October. Uh, so given that the proposed land use is not allowed within the Haigas Parkway Zoning District, the applicant is proposing a new contract zone with the town. The board is charged with advising the applicant of any changes to the proposed contract zone agreement necessary to conform to a preliminary approval. Staff's review of the application identified that the proposed contract zone agreement and design of the project could be modified to better complement the existing development in the, in the area. The board should be sure to discuss the merits of the suggested modifications to the contract zone agreement as identified in staff comments. Uh, specifically, the board should be sure to discuss the proposed design approach, architectural detailing, and the proposed off-site masonry sign in the right-of-way with the applicant. And now I'll ask Angela uh, Blanchett to discuss some stormwater management elements. Um, Staff has made um, comments related to the feedback that we got in the past meeting from the planning board for the site and really related to um, low impact development. And um, I know there have been comments in the past, um, staff comments that have been responded to by the applicant, but the designer looking at um, okay, one particular um, type of LAD. Staff would just like to kind of investigate that a little more and see what other options they've looked at or considered and what um, issues have come up with those. Um, and one particular that in conversation with DEP on uh, other larger sites in this watershed, uh, particularly is looking at these large kind of rooftop areas and treating maybe stormwater differently because it's, a, it's obviously like cleaner water coming off the roof than you would off a uh, paved surface in the parking lot. So we just want to want to take a, 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 I guess a closer look at if there's some options we can do with, with some of the stormwater on the site. Um, and also looking at the street access piece on the Haigas Parkway, it, it seems like something that we should probably discuss or the board should have a conversation about earlier on because um, it can also impact where the stormwater facilities end up. Right now it's looping around where they're showing one, but um, trying to get that conversation early on I think is important. Um, because those two might be tied together um, where your stormwater facilities end up and, and where your impact will be on Okay. Thank you. All set. So again, this is um, part of a contract zone request, and as folks will remember, it's a little different in that there's sort of a, a parallel process or, or a... Um, overlapping process with the town council which ultimately is the arbiter of whether the applicant has met the, the thresholds for public benefit and some of the other things uh, that are part of the contract zone process so the board's role at this stage is really to focus on the site plan elements we did have the opportunity at a joint workshop back when this was first introduced to weigh in on some of the public benefit and we can certainly be mindful of that but again our primary focus uh, right now really is on the site plan elements so with that, I will hand it over to the applicant's team. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, James Seymour, civil engineer and project manager from Sebago Technics. With me this evening, uh, to my right, is Adam Ahrens, uh, owner of Patriot Subaru and would-be Patriot Acura, who will have a few things to present to you this evening. But uh, basically, our concern this evening is um, looking at the site. We know the board and the council uh, liked the layout that we presented. I think there's some challenges that we all have to kind of look at closely. Uh, we have, uh, we feel pretty confident in what we've done, and I think those two items are the placement of the structure itself as it presents to the corner appearance, and the second is the alignment of the entrance off Hygis as it aligns with first look, uh, which is on the opposite side. Um, just quickly, um, the concern is, is that obviously we're here for a contract zone. This is a car dealership. Um, there's certain elements and components they need to exist as a business. And one of those is to have front yard display of vehicles. And I know in the review comments we've talked about that front, as it's shown there, black uh, being a parking area. It really is a display area. And I do have a plan this evening that I can share with the board briefly, which we've kind of tried to designate areas of how it's the use of the parking lot will be designated from display, inventory, customer parking, and so on, just to give you an idea of how we feel this will, will uh, orient it and or be organized. Um, the second part is the alignment of the access onto Hagus. 
we have used a controlled access point that was determined by MDOT. Uh, in the conversations and memos that we've received from the traffic consultant, there's a push to move that closer to the intersection to Payne Road and align directly opposite of first look. I think we had that conversation at the last sketch plan we were at. The concern with that is it moving that congestion closer to the intersection. There is an island there, and with the left turn movement to get into the Acura site, that could become problematic with the alignment of that end of Highgis as it approaches Payne Road and what that does. If I had a suggestion, I would be to move it further away uh, to give you a little more distance. The problem is the separation of the two entrances. They don't meet the standard for the town, so a waiver would have to be granted if we're to keep that alignment. Um, one of the things that we discovered in discussing with MDOT is on their records, the speed limit through this area is 35 miles an hour. What is posted is 45, and there's a disparity of how this got up to 45 miles an hour. Regardless, they've suggested we stay with the 45 miles an hour as that's the posted speed limit. That's what people are going to drive or exceed to drive. So we should be designing around that, even though there is a disparity between state and local. Um, we're currently uh, just completed some traffic trip counts that were uh, recommended by the consultant Bill Bray for the town. Those were conducted on a Saturday, which happens to be our peak trip day. Um, those results have not been furnished yet. We won't probably have those till after Thanksgiving. Um, at that time, we can take a closer look again at the traffic um, sims and all the design criteria that goes into that to look at the queue and see what impact that will have on that um, alignment of the driveway. The other piece of this is obviously the second access, which we feel is safe off of Payne Road, which for, has a couple of good features. One, um, we do meet the standards. We have more than 50 peak trips. So we meet the standards as far as that goes. But it allows our car carriers that come off the turnpike to make that left and go into the site. And if you look, you have that long stretch. It's a perfect location for the car carrier to do its um, discharge of vehicles or loading of vehicles without being on Payne Road or being close to the intersections or being in a, a location where site or anything could be of a hazard. It's, uh, it's part of the design we've, we've been working with all along. So we feel that's one of the important access for uh, deliverables. It would be right in, right out. There's a barrier there that prevents the left turn movement. Uh, we have put an island in there, but we will work with the consultant to come up with a proper orientation that he feels is safe and eliminates anybody from trying to make that left turn, even though it is impossible. Um, with that, I'll let Aaron give a few words, and then we'll come back to the items if you'd like. Well, again, thank you, and uh, hopefully, uh, Commissioner, or uh, uh, Chair, hopefully we can finish this before you retire from your <laughs> current post. Uh, that is one of my goals, at least. Um, you know, as we've gone through this process and we've tried to accommodate um, the environment and certainly the, uh, the town, uh, and we're very mindful of that, we're also mindful of the economic stress that this project has become in some ways. And, and some of that is indicated, and I know you had discussion earlier about bad soil. This is not a great piece of property to build on. Um, and maybe that's one of the reasons that it's there. And, our, and we've run into some significant expenses in wanting to be there, as in um, improving the, the property from below ground. Um, and that will be a significant expense. And I don't, this is not something that's on you, but it is on us to make this economically feasible to do that. Um, but that doesn't mean we're going to do anything that would, in, um, that would challenge the safety of the location, that would challenge the environment of the location, and would um, compromise uh, anything that the city wants to have done. So, um, And I think that uh, Jim and, and Dave, our architect, um, are here to share with you the responses to those questions that you guys have brought up, and that uh, we hope that we can get quickly to an approval. So. All right. Thank you. So first and foremost, I think the thing that the board and the council wanted to see is the perspective of what this would look like from the intersection. This top rendering here gives you an example of what that would look like. Obviously, we are planning on having a low wall, which would be within the, the right-of-way component of this property. The property does not come down and make a perfect 90. It has a jog that goes across the corner. Uh, it's there for some utilities and some gas lines that cut through that corner and serve up pain and go down Hygis. 
Um, the idea would be that we provide the necessary buffers. Um, there's a large stand of trees there now, both on Payne and Hygus. The idea is that we would maintain a lot of that mature vegetation, prune up 10, 12 feet, uh, just to clean it up and make some lawn space underneath, but use those mature trees that are there in conjunction with some other plantings uh, to make that work for buffering a good portion of the building as you're looking at it. <coughs> Excuse me. Primarily the view coming off of Payne and coming off Hygis, but as you come to that intersection, as you can see by the perspective, you have a nice clean look at this nice modern architecture and plaza for display purposes. Um, along the section of Hagus beyond the entrance would remain in its natural state. Um, as you go through there now, uh, those trees are all telephone pole height or higher, of mixed vegetation, oaks, maples, pines, so they make an excellent buffer for that rear parking lot as we have it positioned behind the building. Um, the next piece uh, to Angela's comment is dealing with stormwater. We are under a site location of development permit, which the town, you, will be responsible for the site portion of the work, but the stormwater has to go through the main DEP. Uh, we're in kind of a holding pattern here until we get things settled down with the entrance because, as she mentioned, one of our larger treatment areas is located between that arc uh, access into the site and the Hagus, Hagus, I can call it Hagus, um, uh, sideline. So we really need to have these components agreed to, and that's one of the things I'm hoping this evening that the board can give us some direction as they support our location of the structure or support the location of the entrance because it plays such a vital portion into the stormwater. We have three ponds infiltration areas basically on the site which are excellent from the standpoint of they allow us to have a shallow containment, cool the runoff, and discharge it before as it goes into those wetlands and stream which are located off the far southeast end of the property. We did look at buffers because of the proximity of wetlands. We couldn't get the depth of buffers, and to do that, we have to <coughs> elevate the road even more. We looked at wet ponds. The problem with the wet ponds is the depth necessary, and we'd be deep into these poor soils and in construction, it would be an absolute mess. It'd be very difficult with the tracking of very greasy clay soils uh, and what that would do. And one pond would be massive, um, and it becomes a maintenance issue and everything. These small infiltration areas are much easier to manage, maintain. Uh, we can make them aesthetically work within the property. Um, but because of the soils, we're really limited on what we can do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when we came before the sketch plan, we were really focused on wet ponds, but we just found that those would be such a burden because it, there's a mean depth that you have to have to design these, and these ponds would be substantially deep. We'd be looking at something 12, maybe 15 feet deep. Um, very difficult to maintain and upkeep, and to clean in the future, and so on. These are much shallower compounds. Like I mentioned, they treat the water effectively with a filtration process, and further, they cool the water before it's discharged back into the natural environment. All great components for what we're trying to do here in the Willowdale Brook. So we did look at various things. As far as roof water goes, we still treat that. Um, we can sometimes ask or request a waiver from the DEP, but it depends. Um, again, there's a thermal component to that roof water uh, that we want to try to cool it before it gets discharged. So that is something that we can have a discussion with DEP, but at this time we're in a holding pattern waiting for you folks and us to come to an agreement on maybe site features so that we can hold the pattern with our stormwater design and move forward so we can submit a lengthy process with the DEP for that as well. So um, obviously this is your first look at the uh, design as it appears from the intersection. Um, a nice low wall, which we have a Scarborough presentation on it. Give back something that shows you're at the gateway of Scarborough. Uh, a nice presentation of landscaping, and then looking at that nice new building. Dave Richards from Gowan Turgeon is here this evening. If you do have questions regarding the architecture or any of the materials, the only thing I'll leave you with is on this backboard. parking management plan, looking at the various components, and uh, as you can see, the salmon color on that plan represents display and inventory, a large chunk. Majority of your service, 
sales parts are located immediately on the side of the building or behind the building, but that whole area in the front would be display, a large area in the back would be inventory, just to give you some perspective on how we anticipate the management to work. Um, with that, if you have any questions for us, we'll be glad to answer. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dave Richards. I'm an architect with Gowan Trojan Architects. The last time we met, a request was made to show the building in context so that was, the images you saw were the building with nothing around it. So we've gone through the exercise of locating the building on the site with the planned plantings and also the plaza. And this is kind of an overhead view of it, giving kind of just a, a, a general idea of the building on the site. The two renderings below are kind of from Hagus and Payne. They do not indicate where all the trees, because there's much more trees that would be there. I don't have a survey to, in, to know where all they, where they are, and I think the exercise was to show you the proportions of the building, you know, how we use the uh, uh, design guidelines for buildings over 20,000 square feet, where we broke the building into its, com you know, into component parts. Essentially, one of the large areas is the customer service area, showroom, service drop-off, and then the other area is the workshop. They are treated with dif differently with materials. Um, EFIS, and I'll get, have a board to show you the materials here in a moment. Let me move to the other views here. In our earlier presentations, we showed uh, renderings, which you're seeing up above. Uh, and so I chose those same sites to show you what the project would look like in context with plantings, with the paving, the plaza, and, and whatnot. So essentially they're the, the same views, but again, uh, in a more realistic presentation. Um, I'm going to move quickly to... The materials of construction are uh, primarily, well, it depends on the part of the building. For the showroom and the client support areas, those are EFIS. Uh, there is a band around the base of the building uh, that is the darker EFIS, the light EFIS, later color EFIS is uh, above the base band. There are metal panels that are blue and silver that circumscribe the client access areas. Um, also the uh, coping at the top, that is uh, a silver mill finish. Um, typical, the storefront would be the same color. The uh, dealership pylon would be also this mill finish, a Luca Bond or metal panel. Um, and then the showroom, or excuse me, the workshop would be a vertical metal panel system, essentially the same color as the building. Um, the uh, car wash would be, again, a similar color, vertical. Uh, it's, it's a plastic panel that's filled with concrete. And they're designed to deal with the forces of a car wash, which is essentially a daily hurricane. Um, you have any questions that I can help with? Thanks. If that if that's uh, that concludes the, the team's presentation, um, we'll open it up to any public comment, and then we'll turn to board discussion. I'm sure there'll be some comments and questions. Do we have any uh, public comment? All right. Seeing none, we'll turn to the board. Rick, you just didn't. Sure. Um, I appreciate the renditions. Very helpful. And you guys did a good job with this in the middle, too. I think this is a nice project. Um, I think it's good for the town. I like actors. Uh, 
increases the property value, tax base, um, and while they're thinking about their car, they're going to go buy lunch somewhere, which helps all the small people. Um, I, I guess I have a question, just because we just had a last applicant in here. Um, it's got road frontage on two roads. It's got two entrances, right? So am I missing something? No? What do you mean by that? If that's a question to ask, we... we... I'm asking, <laughs> I'm asking, question for? I'm asking everybody on this side. No, I, 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 Because I'm looking at two roads and two entrances. I think it's a great project. I'm all for it. I, I will. I mean, for a preliminary, I think it's really good. I will just point out that our traffic peer reviewer has commented on that, um, on the first page of the traffic peer review, and okay. just states, the applicant's traffic consultant should provide supporting detailed traffic information that clearly shows the proposed access design provides both the safety and congestion benefit to the impact of the street system. And that was the comment from the traffic peer reviewer okay. in regards to your question. I'm, I'm a, I agree with that comment. I have no problem with road frontage on both roads. Rick, uh, it's, it sounds like one of the th key things the applicant's looking for is, is feedback from us on overall kind of building uh, location and orientation as well as the location of uh, the Hygus entrance and whether that's aligned with first look. Do you have any opinions on that one way or another? I actually like the way it's oriented because when you're coming off of exit 42, it's, you know, the first thing you're going to see is the accuracy. I'm um, sorry, maybe I should be telling you. <laughs> I like the way you oriented it. I like the fact that when you're coming off the exit, you, it's right there, so you don't have to look too far for it. Um, I know that we require buffering so that you kind of have to hide what you're trying to sell, but, um, you know, if, if you can see the sign, most, most people are going to be drawn in by that, so... Um, yeah, I would I would try to do the best you can with all the landscape, um, and keep it. I think it's oriented well. So, I'm good with it. thanks, Rachel. Yeah, um, I too was looking at the uh, two entrances and was wondering, since uh, your stated purpose of having the entrance off of um, Payne Road was the uh, in order to have the, the car carriers have a straight line, what would be the possibility, or what do you think of the possibility of um, having a gate on that so that it is only used by the car haulers? And the gate then can be opened when somebody is coming, and that would limit the uh, access onto, onto Payne Road. And I'm just throwing that out as, as an option for you to take a look at. While it's certainly an option, what we see is everybody turning right into both areas. So if somebody were to come across and turn left out of the uh, out of the exit from exit 42, if they came to that light, they'd turn left and then come right in as a consumer as well, um, which would pose zero traffic issues and pose zero safety issues. Um, I, th I think we've all learned that left-hand turns seem to be the the issue. So I'm not totally opposed to what you're bringing up, but I think that it might cause more problems than it, we, we certainly don't intend for anybody to turn left out of that out of the main road uh, uh, entrance. And we would mark that to make sure that that wouldn't happen. I, I, but <clears throat> like Rick, I am a little uh, sensitive to the question of the two two entrances. So that that might be something to to look at again. I have no objection to the uh, change in the uh, entrance exit off of Hygus Parkway to moving that. Um, I'm familiar with the traffic that's there and uh, in general, and I think actually that that would be better than having it directly across from the first look. Um, I, let me talk a little bit about the buffering and the parking in front, and I, I understand the need for the display. Uh, the building is oriented well, I think. Uh, the drawings are, present 
uh, something, let me use the term classy. Uh, I bought my last car from Patriot Subaru, so I, you know, I'm, uh, you folks run a good operation. Thank you very much. Um, but I, there's an awful lot of display in the front, and I really would need to see a lot more in terms of the landscape buffering. Just to me, a, a car dealership is a destination, it's not an impulse buy. So people are looking for you, they're not driving by and saying, ooh, I see that, I, I see that car there, I'm gonna you know, come in and buy it. Um, so the display is really for the folks who are already on site, and to that extent, you can provide more screening, more buffering. Um, you can provide certainly a, a view through of the building, uh, through that uh, buffering, so that as people come off of Hygus Parkway, or excuse me, come off of 95, there you are. But then screening to either side of the building, covering some of the display um, from the road would be helpful. Uh, and, and I apologize if I'm interrupting, but. Um, when our architect, when Dave um, created those, and you see those empty spots, those are actually going to be islands in between to break up the row after row. But if you go into South Portland or you go into Westbrook or you go into Saco, what you see is row after row after row of cars. And while I totally agree people will find us before they find us, um, if the shelves don't look full, people don't go into your store. So we have to have an appearance that we have inventory as well as be sensitive to the community and the desire uh, of the community. And we certainly don't have a straightaway like not comparing us to the existing car dealers in, in the town, but you've got a, a straight line of cars after car after car. Ours is not going to be that. There's going to be curves. Um, there's going to be breaking up of island and there's going to be significant shrubs and trees in front of our cars. And, and I will say this, that um, they have to satisfy me as well, and I have the same view that you do, but we also have to satisfy that there are some people that want to see that we have cars there too. Yeah, I, I, I'm just letting you know that as we go along, that's going to, what I will be looking for if this <coughs> comes to fruition is, is the balance between the, the display and the buffering. Um, because we don't want the lines of cars, and we don't want to be Westbrook, and we don't want to be Saco. Um, we're Scarborough, and we pay attention to the landscaping, to the buffering, and to the, to, to the visuals. And that's what we will be looking for, or certainly I will. Um, I like the design of the building. Uh, as it goes forward, I've got, I will have some more, obviously, some more suggestions. Um, I like the layout that you have. I like the uh, the park, the proposed recreation area that you've set up, uh, the consideration for your customers, and I wish you every success. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Robin? Um, yeah, Jim, you had talked about a little bit about some options that you talked about for stormwater. Um, where where are you? <coughs> your submittal to DEP, where, where did you leave that at for stormwater management? We have not submitted to DEP. We've had a pre-application, and that's where we stand. Obviously, the orientation of everything plays into the stormwater, so until we have this preliminary discussion or <coughs> acceptance or approval, it's very difficult for us to move forward. As we move forward and we change, we go back into the queue with the DEP, and it's a time-sensitive issue. So we're trying to do this once. Yep. Um, so that's where we are. Um, we met with them, gone over this. We follow the BMPs. We meet their standards for Chapter 500. I understand that the town has concerns, and we do too, as does Adam and Patriot Acura, about the sensitivity <coughs> of the environment. But we think we've come up, we've, we've met what you wanted, which was not to focus it on one area, but to distribute that out over three areas, um, meeting kind of the existing watersheds there. Providing a BMP, which I mentioned, provides both treatment and cooling, which are very important, as you well know, to the whole ecosystem for Willowdale for putting that cool water back in is as important as anything. So one of the things we had talked about, though, with the joint meeting with the town council was addressing flooding yes, standards and, and issues. Yes, and we do meet the flood standards. Okay, and also bringing in some public benefit there. So had, had you given any 
look to uh, a way to address the, the flooding issues there? We've had early discussion uh, with the town about you know, looking at uh, replacement of some culverts. Um, it wasn't on anyone's immediate CIP list. So um, to that answer, I would say no. Um, I, we're in an isolated area. Uh, obviously, Route 1 is the next impact of the flooding. Mm -hmm. um, all this goes into big wetlands out behind crossroads and, and down to Hygis. Um, the culvert capacity is adequate and meets all the standards and has very flooding issues on the Hygis side. On the other side, over near Cabela's, obviously you've had conditions over there, but that's more of a just the whole design geographic setting. It's nothing that can really easily be solved. Yeah. So let me just point out, I guess, in the in Scarborough's stormwater ordinance, which should be considered um, supplemental to DEP standard, that we do like to, in G4, abrupt changes to natural drainage ways and grades shall be avoided. Natural drainage ways shall not be filled unless permitted by the planning board, and transitional grading shall be used to blend all earthworks. You already said, somebody said it before, it's a challenging site. Mm -hmm. You have a significant amount of wetlands there, and as my statics teacher always said, you can't push on a rope. So you're not going to make that water go where it doesn't want to go, and so it's going to have some very, very complex challenges that, that need to be addressed there. But please keep your eye on public interest, the public benefit mm -hmm. and the public interest as you move forward. Um, because the other thing I'll be looking for with respect to just the overall purpose of the stormwater management ordinance in G is that the plan should be designed to complement the hydrology and natural features of the site and shall not cause adverse impacts to abutters, downstream properties, or receiving waters because that's what we got happening over there already. Mm -hmm. So let's not, let's not bring it over to this side and just keep in mind too that we're trying to keep the water on the site and when you cut down the trees and you manipulate the wetlands, you, you've just multiplied the issue um, kind of thing. So also keep in mind, um, under the site plan review section F, the landscape buffering and green space, item F3, wherever practical, existing specimen trees, clusters, and other vegetation shall be preserved. That's going to be your best friend on right. the site here. So I think, you know, I'd like to see you push the public benefit in. Uh, I think my comment in the joint uh, town council planning board meeting was there's a lot of people in Scarborough who consider the gateway to Scarborough the marsh or that beautiful stand of trees that we have there on the site currently. So um, please be mindful of that. I think we also need to see a written landscape maintenance plan, which is required under F9A. And um, I would encourage you to bring the town engineer with you to the next DEP meeting, because DEP has a new stormwater engineer, Ben Viola is gone, as you know. Um, and there, there are a lot of changes, and they are integrating what the town, you know, what, what the town and the watershed specific needs are and roof drip line trenches would be a, a good way to, to do that, although you can't really infiltrate anything there because that, of the that's ground. The, that's the challenging yeah. part, and that's why I, I, we've elevated this site, obviously, to get above the groundwater so that we have the capacity yeah. to infiltrate, yeah. which is one of the limitations. Uh, and I totally hear you, and just to be perspective, the only area that we're really clearing out is that immediate corner. Other than that, we're working with all that natural vegetation and yeah. want to restore that. It's Please. They're beautiful specimens, and we really want to work Please. with Please, and as you go, please keep a sort of like an inventory of you go to show us. You know, for me, that would be a great public benefit to show what tree stands are remaining, things that are untouched and undisturbed, and how we're sort of maintaining the natural character of that area there. It's really, I think it's it's um, incredibly important. I can't, um, I can't stress it enough. Also, what are you going to be doing with your unsuitable soils? That's that's my typical question. I'm going to be asking. Yeah, those would be trucked off site. Okay, but we'll want to know the depth, you know the disposition of those type types of thing, please. And um, I'm going to also bring it back to the to the um, access ways. I'm not sure why we're 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 allowing two access ways here. Um, I I can't understand it myself. So um, maybe that's a discussion for us internally. 
Um, but in general, the merits on the contract zone, I'm going to be looking for public benefit, public benefit, public benefit, because that's, that's what contract zoning is all about, what, what benefits you can bring to the town from a, from a, a, you know, basically a drainage perspective, a stormwater perspective, environmental perspective. Um, I think you guys are all over it as far as the economic benefit that you'll bring. Uh, you got it there, but um, keep doing what you're doing. Best of luck to you. Thanks. Nick? Yeah, thanks. Um, appreciate the renderings that we'd asked for and the elevations. Uh, they are helpful. And, uh, and I'll say this, um, you know, kind of one of those major recurring themes through staff comments has been the landscaping, the buffering, the appearance of what is going to be the entry to Scarborough. And for what it's worth, I like that stone wall. I think something that saves the town of Scarborough in there would be fantastic. It, it is kind of a welcoming, open site. If you can guarantee the blue skies and sun, it would be fantastic. <laughs> um, we wouldn't be here. Right. So um, that said, uh, I think the traffic engineer did note that you need some more work um, on getting above that threshold for the corner lots with two accesses. I feel here, um, this is a little bit different than that last one in the sense that I'm, I don't know if I have the data, but I'm convinced that I guess is going to end up being as busy as Payne Road based on the proposed developments going on in the Scarborough Downs. We have the Gateway Commons projects right over there. Um, and then of course we just saw another applicant tonight for some more, uh, some more commercial retail space. So I think it's coming and I know our standard says it needs to be on the least, lesser of the busy roads. Um, I, th I think here, it, you know, you might have end up in a 50-50 split. They might be equally as busy at some point uh, based on what's going on for development. But uh, that said, you still have a threshold and a standard that has to be met within our ordinance. And as the last applicant will tell you, I'm going to hold you to it because um, I think it's important. I do. Um, as far as uh, what I see there, I like it. Um, I don't have any major issues with the layout construction architecture I think it's a car dealership that looks nice so um, I think that's probably it for me um, on the stormwater I, I would um, be interested to hear discussions about the the roof treating the roof runoff um, and I don't I can't say I know enough about it to say that I, I have strong opinions on how it must be dealt with but I think it's worth seeing if there's something more you can do with it. And, uh, and I hope something productive comes out of the discussion with the town and you know, your team as well. So, um, As far as the, the other, um, you know, the waivers on the aisle lengths, completely fine with. And I know they want islands in between every 15 parking spots. I, I get what you're doing here. I don't think that that's, that's a waiver I would be comfortable with considering the type of business. Also considering the buffering you're going to have back there just from the, the natural uh, you know, trees that you have. And so outside of that, I think I'm pretty good. Thank you. Thanks. Roger? Um, I, think the, uh, I think the project looks terrific, too. Um, I, I have a couple of questions on the entrance, um, the view from right here. Um, on, on your A103, this one here, I'm just kind of curious if you could, I'm looking at um, A1 and A11. I, I, do you plan to have any kind of um, vegetation or uh, um, buffering or anything? Yeah, that, yes. The, the, uh, Stay up with the mic, please. Yeah. Yes, the, the vegetation isn't in the drawing so that you could see the building. There were comments about whether the building had been uh, broken up into smaller component points and with all of the vegetation in front of it, you would have seen vegetation. So it, it, I, I erred towards showing the building as opposed to showing the building in context. Okay, so those, so um, those, th 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 those locations are heavily treed along, along the road. So in front of the, um, the display vehicles, where right now it just looks like it's just pavement, so um, you don't have them up there. 
Uh, yeah, the top one. Uh, the top. Yeah. Uh, see the, see the, uh, the one you have? Yeah, the, the yeah, bottom we're, portion we're, of it. Yeah, we're, we're in front of the trees. We're, we're the, 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 yeah, we're, uh, this is the drive, so the, the road, the trees themselves are behind you in this image. Oh, you're not going to have, oh, right, are we, right where that, you, you say is a drive, that's not going to oh, be I, where the displays I'm sorry. are? I'm talking about the drawing above. Uh, he, here, these two drawings, the trees have not been put in the rendering so that you could see the building. Okay, okay. Uh, the, the, you know, we can provide those, but I, I thought my first task as the architect was to show that the building had been broken up into smaller uh, pieces for the... Okay. Sure. I think one of the things that we can do for the final is give you um, a more higher scale drawing of what the plaza looks like and then take a step back and look what it looks like from the wall to the building. Give you a little bit better context of the height of the landscaping and the buffering. I know that's a major concern. And one of the comments that we did have that came back was a little burdensome, which we're opposed to is uh, actually surveying every tree out there that's three inches in diameter. I, I think what we'd like to do is a little bit of a medium ground where we would, prior to construction, we'd flag all the trees in the tree save areas. We'd identify those on the plan with various bubbles to show you where those tree save areas, tree save areas would be. And then during construction, those would all be basically labeled as no touch uh, during construction. Do you have something you want to say, Corey? No, I was just going to piggyback on what you said about, or um, Seymour said about uh, renderings for the next iteration, and and just just say that I, I think it would be helpful when you do that to sort of do that at driver level, so that we're really getting what the view is going to be as you come off of exit 42 or as you're coming down Payne Road. It's helpful to have the bird's eye views at this stage, definitely, and we appreciate being able to see the architecture, but I think as you come back with a more fully developed landscape plan and everything else, it'll be helpful for us to really be able to kind of visualize what's it really going to look like? What, what is, what's that view corridor going you to look like? You want to scale profile view of basically right. sitting at the intersection. Right. So. Okay. Um, I, I'm just kind of curious, if I recall, that very corner is owned by the state, isn't it? Isn't there a small portion right there? Yes, that triangle that you see on the, on the drawing behind you. Uh, there's a triangle right there that's owned. It's part of the it's part of the right of way. Now, are you are you going to be able to maintain that, or is or is anything can grow there? Because that's going to ruin your stone wall and everything. <laughs> that's a discussion we'll have to have with the town and with the state. Uh, obviously, both you and the council pushed us to to put some kind of identification within that. Uh, we'll have to follow through to see what maintenance or who has responsibility <laughs> within that going forward. Okay. If not, we may have some space that we could move that back right at the property line. Sh shuffles a few things around, but ideally we'd like to have it right where it is. Gives you the best vision as you're coming off the, the turnpike. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you also, on, in your presentation, on your page 7, uh, you were talking about in response to 10. Um, regarding the application of porous surfaces had proven unpredictable to weather conditions and sandy contamination. I think that was in reference to the, um, the, the large parking area. Correct. In the back. And um, I think I'm familiar with that surface because I think they have it over at USM. Um, at I know Falmouth High School has some. I've done the project at St. Joe's. We've put some in. It's very difficult to maintain. Is all I You're talking about the porous asphalt? Yeah. Yes. Be, uh, primarily because of, of the poor soils you have there. You know? Well, it's that and the winter sanding. You, the winter sanding is the most detrimental to that porous asphalt because you get all the fines off of the <coughs> gravel. And then you have a site that people are coming up the public way where all we use is sand and gravel. It easily compacts and, and gets in there. And it's, it's a lot of maintenance to maintain and keep the, the water from being able to migrate down through that tall and that porous interior. Okay. Um, if I can ask Nick a question on the islands in the, in the back parking area, mm. did you say you didn't feel the need to have those, or did you say? I don't think. That, I think the requirement is every 15 spaces they're right, supposed yeah. to have one. 
I said I understand what the nature of that is, and I don't think they need them. Okay, I, I would tend to agree with that. And the only last question I have for you is um, when I was reading your presentation, you were talking about your dilemma regarding the soils and whether to preload or right. to go down. Right. But you didn't say what you were going to do. <laughs> well, it's, it's cost effective, obviously. Uh, the, the most uh, economic condition would be to preload, but it's a substantial amount of time, and obviously with property and everything like that, time is money. Uh, I believe we're leading to driving uh, steel pile. Okay. Um, we are. <laughs> okay. The, the only last question I have is um, on the uh, entrance on Payne Road. Um, if it's left the way it's designed there, it seems to me you're going to have people traveling along Payne Road who are going to try and come into the property. They um, are from to take a right in. Yes. Yes. That, and, the, both and those the, both those entrances exist today. Is that is that designed as right in and right out, or yes, is that yes. right in right out? Only so if right people in. heading south, south can't get across there because you have a, a barrier island. Oh, is there an island right yes. there? Yes. Okay. I, I, I couldn't recall whether it was or not. Okay. I, I think I'm all set right now. Thanks, Roger. Jay, did you have something? Um, yeah, I guess the only, just as the conversation around sort of the tree save area uh, was going on, I know this is an issue that this board has grappled with with other um, projects in the Highest Parkway, is really trying to be sure that, you know, any grading or utility work that's being done, what those impacts are going to be. And so just, you know, as they do think about future submissions, really having their landscape architect really think about the constructability and, and the survivability of any existing trees within that area. And, you know, then that way we know what we might expect to actually be there at the end of the project or what might need to be augmented uh, as part of their landscape plan. That's yeah. all I was going to reference. And we plan to pull most of the utilities off of Payne Road, uh, obviously to keep the highest most heavily vegetated, but we're trying to condense everything to come through that entrance with utilities so we don't get into multiple openings to your column. I, I did just have one more thing on, on the uh, alignment. On uh, I guess I guess I got you doing. <laughs> I've only I'm been sorry. here since '79, so fault. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, I think it's in the uh, staff comments and about leaving it up to staff and them to discuss that. And I, I, I would tend to go along with that because I, I don't have a feeling one way or the other on that. <coughs> no, sir. Well, sir. Thanks. Um, so I think I'm pretty much on the same wavelength as my colleagues here on the board. I, I'm, I, I think I'm happy with the building placement and orientation. Um, recognize that, as has been noted, it's a challenging site in terms of soils and, and, and groundwater. Um, and we also understand that, you know, it is a car dealership at the end of the day and that you've got to balance some, some things. Um, but given all that and given the fact that I, am, I agree that the the architecture um, looks promising. I would, but one comment I would make on that is, you know, and it seems like you're on the right track, but make sure, continue to avoid, you know, truly reflective material. Um, and also, as, as we often, um, as we often say, make sure you're not neglecting the sort of the side elevations. Um, understanding, of course, it sounds like that's gonna be more, more sort of left in more of a natural state along, along those frontages. Right. We just want to make sure we don't neglect those. Um, uh, in terms of the dual access, as Mr. McGee noted, uh, you know, the, the applicant will need to meet those thresholds through its traffic analysis, and we'll look forward to seeing that. I'll also agree with Mr. McGee that, um, you know, the context does matter, and, and I know we had a difficult discussion with the previous uh, applicant. Um, I think there definitely is a, you know, a a real qualitative difference between a section of Route 1 where we have four lanes of high-speed traffic uh, versus a situation like this where you have two roads that, as Nick said, are arguably going to be sort of e potentially equal um, in terms of their level of intensity. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, there are some differences and we do have some room for discretion. That said, again, you'll need to make, make sure you meet that threshold and we will, we'll take a look at that carefully. Um, I'm also in agreement that I'm, you know, I think I'm fine with not having the, the highest curb cut aligned with first look. Um, I don't 
see that there's a whole lot of um, overlap there in terms of fun you know functionality and traffic and I agree with the impulse to want to keep that away as far away from the um, Payne Road intersection as you can um, just looking back through here we talked about stormwater and uh, continuing to explore low income low low income uh, low impact development um, and I agree with the Saunders that the, the sort of the stormwater and flooding piece is a is a potential um, avenue for for addressing the public benefit threshold which again ultimately is going to be up to the town council with this being a, a contract zone um, and we talked also about um, having that you know the sort of the ground level renderings showing the, 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 the landscaping which will be as has been noted um, that will be critical here given that you know again we accept this is a car dealership and you want people to be able to see your inventory you want people to be able to see your signage in your building um, and you seem genuinely committed to really wanting this to be an attractive gateway um, so we we'll just want to make sure that uh, you know that the landscaping is 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 really robust and that we try to maintain as much existing um, vegetation as we can there so hopefully that's helpful feedback for you and um, we'll look forward to seeing you next time unless you have anything else for us do we need to make a formal preliminary approval this evening or do we just proceed because the next step would be that interconnection with the council again yeah I think I think we, we need to see more so before I, I guess I'll just chime in and just say before it does go to council this board would need to make a formal preliminary approval right. and so then uh, I would turn it back to the board to discuss it that, that's right. at their discretion so, of course um, and my I guess my position on it is given that we still need to see traffic study and we have some other things that are out there that I don't think we're quite quite ready for preliminary I think right. it's you're definitely on the right track and I think you can be confident in your in your building uh, location and, and orientation and in the curb cuts uh, with the caveat that again with the, the dual access will be contingent on um, meeting the thresholds in the ordinance okay. uh, well, hopefully you can get, uh, get to your last meeting all right <laughs> That's I hope so goal. too thank you thank, thank you, you. All right, before we introduce the next item, just a reminder that uh, the board cannot take up any new items after 1030. So those of you who are a little further down on the agenda, just be mindful of that. And uh, we apologize in advance that we're not able to get to you. You would be put at the top of the next agenda. That said, we'll uh, move as efficiently as we can. And uh, we'll now introduce agenda item number 10, Main Life Care Retirement Community, Inc., requests a preliminary subdivision and site plan review as part of a contract zone for 5 Dorado Drive, Piper Shores Dorado, Assessor's Map R91, Lot 1D. Jamel, thank you. this one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this, this project is also a, pr a proposed contract zone. Uh, this is project is located in the RF zoning district uh, off of Dorado Drive uh, along Spurwink Road. So the applicant is proposing a new senior independent living campus off of Dorado Drive that includes 16 duplex units, a mixed-use commons building consisting of 28 apartment units, eight single-family homes, a public access trailhead, and a large open space centrally located on the campus. The applicant was last before the board for a sketch plan review in July. Uh, since then, the applicant has met with staff and has further refined the proposal. Staff has suggested several re revisions to the contract zone agreement uh, related to density and buffering, uh, as seen in the staff review comments. And as requested by the board in July, a wetland peer review was completed on the property. Uh, the applicant should update the board on the revisions made to the wetland delineation uh, as a result of that peer review. Staff would like to point out that, that the applicant is proposing an enhanced buffering design. That includes a 200-foot front setback and 50-foot side and rear setbacks on the property. Given that the board and staff encourage the applicant to provide pedestrian access to public access trails on the Piper Shores property across Spurwink Road, the applicant is proposing a, pedest a pedestrian connection across the road way to the existing uh, Piper Shores campus. The town's traffic peer reviewer identified that this section of Spurwink Road is outside of the town's jurisdiction and a crosswalk at this location will require main DOT approval. 
uh, staff is willing to work through these details with the applicant. The applicant is also providing a public trailhead parking area toward the rear, towards the rear of the property. The trailhead will provide access to existing trails on the property and a connection to the Camp Ketcha trails located on the abutting property to the north. Staff also provided some comments suggesting additional sidewalk connections and streetscape en enhancements on the campus. And uh, we would just like to point out that staff did receive two letters from several neighbors who reside on Newcomb Ridge Road and Acorn Lane. Uh, and these letters have been provided to the board for their consideration tonight. With that, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jamel. And uh, just another quick note, as with the prior item, this is contract zone item. Uh, and as such, the, the, town, the town council will be the ultimate arbiter of whether the applicant has met the public benefit standard. And we can certainly weigh in on that, um, but our focus really is primarily on the site plan element. So with that, I'll turn over to the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Jim Adamovich. I'm CEO of Maine Life Care Retirement Community, which does business as Piper Shores. We're pleased to provide our plan for official consideration of the planning board this evening. Our organization, as indicated, most recently presented to this board on July 16th for input as part, as part of the early planning process. Subsequent to that meeting, we have submitted formal plans to the Department of Environmental Protection. That submission occurred on October 15th and then to this planning board on October 29th. The material submitted supports our application to extend the Piper Schwartz organization to include 52 housing accommodations and limited support services to be constructed on the 5 Dorado Drive parcel. Our plan includes the following elements. A pocket neighborhood consisting of 16 duplex homes centered on a common green space, eight single family homes tucked in a wooded area in the northeast section of the parcel, a hybrid apartment commons building consisting of 28 apartments and modest clubhouse facilities in a single building, and walking trails consisting of public access trail network that is predominantly located in the property setback zones. Uh, with the Piper Shores organization this evening are representatives from the following organizations. Um, Sebago Technics is performing our civil engineering services. They are represented by Will Conway this evening. RLPS Architects is a nationally recognized leader in senior housing design. Uh, they're based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and they are represented by architects and designers Rob Beal and Dustin Julius. Eric Dalen is a principal with One Point Partners, who is serving as an owner's representative for this initiative. And finally, but, uh, last but not least, Charlie Katz-Levy, who is legal counsel for the project with Jensen Baird. We believe that the design that we have presented in July and we will update for you today represents a truly innovative approach to senior housing, one that is not seen in this region and frankly is not seen on a national basis. We think it is sensitive to the unique, the unique characteristics of the location as well as the Scarborough community. Um, it remains a privilege for Piper Shores to be on the forefront of retirement community living services in Maine as we are the only life care, full service, continuing care retirement community in the entire state. Again, we thank the Planning Board for this opportunity to present to you this evening, and I would like to ask Will Conway of Sebago Technics to provide the presentation for the Board. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, Will Conway, Sebago Technics. Um, this is the same plan that we presented to you in July. Um, it, there really haven't been any changes to the, uh, to the layout, and I'll just sort of um, brief you on this. Jim mentioned the, the duplex neighborhood or the pocket neighborhood that's here. The estates are located in this wooded area and the hybrid common building uh, in this position here. And there are distinct segments to the uh, site that I'd like to go over. Um, 
This is the site entrance, and it pretty much aligns, if you're familiar with the existing driveway to the single family home, goes over the crest of the hill and then drops down um, and then approaches the, the other buildings. This is what is different since we were here in July. Uh, we did not have a, a connection to the existing campus, and uh, several board members encouraged us to do that, and we've incorporated that uh, into our plan. This is the pocket neighborhood, um, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. So it's designed with the uh, vehicular circulation on the perimeter, and all of the front entrances to the buildings occur on these two green spaces that open out into this central uh, meadow area here. This is the meadow. It's a central feature of the project. Um, it uh, is adjacent to the pocket neighborhood here. The hybrid commons building looks out over it. And there's a stormwater pond, a, a wet pond, at the low point in this currently open area. Uh, this is the hybrid commons uh, building. Um, you come in to the, off the loop road to the front of the building uh, located here. And then down below at this lower elevation are the common areas, uh, clubhouses, uh, et cetera. And then these two uh, access ways here are uh, fire lanes. They're constructed of uh, permeable pavers. We're using that as a stormwater BMP. And then this is the estates neighborhood. These are eight single family homes. Again, arranged in a pocket configuration with circulation to the outside <coughs> and the buildings opening up onto the, uh, the green spaces. A second stormwater wet pond is located in this area here. This, the end of the road, if you will, is the, uh, the maintenance building, which we don't believe we'll, you'll be seeing in the final plan. At the time we made the submission, uh, Piper Shores thought they wanted to have it. They've since concluded that operationally the, this site can be maintained from the existing maintenance fill facility on the existing campus. The trailhead will, of course, remain. And with that, I'll introduce Rob Beal from RLPS. These guys are really good. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, my name is Robert Beal, and I am an architect with RLPS Architects. Um, with me this evening is Dustin Julius, and he's the lead designer for us. Um, we're really happy to be here and present to you some really unique living arrangements for Piper Shores. Each one of the three building styles is a new type of living for them, and uh, it's just a really exci exciting project. Um, the, the Pocky neighborhood, which Dustin will explain in a little bit more detail, um, is a new type of living where, you know, as Will mentioned, the vehicular traffic is forced to the outside, so it really um, brings the community together in that central green area. We've seen a lot of really nice um, completed projects like this. Uh, the hybrid apartment building is similar. It is cottage style living where we take an apartment building and every apartment has two exposures. So it's not your typical double loaded corridor apartment building. And then we add the commons functions into it. And then last but not least, we have the estate homes. Um, these are gonna be the first single family dwellings for this community and it's just a really exciting neighborhood. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dustin. Thank you, Rob. So I want to take this opportunity to kind of walk through each of these areas in a little bit greater detail as briefly as possible just to give you a little bit of a sense of what these look like in perspective, not only in plan. So as we've been talking, this is the duplex uh, product that forms the pocket neighborhood. Um, and really the impetus behind this philosophy that we call the pocket neighborhood is creating community amongst the residents. So as you can see, these central green spaces provide uh, a way for residents to in interconnect between you know, one front porch to the next. So these are all single story dwellings um, with large front porches that open up into those central greens. Um, we really emphasize the opportunity to bring natural daylighting in, especially for residents of the senior community that would be, uh, would be able to benefit from that. 
Um, the estate homes follow a lot of the same logic that we see here. So we see a similar um, palette of materials, although in this uh, a bit more wooded portion of the site. Um, in this area, we do have two uh, different styles. Um, each of those styles are um, differing in several ways, the most notable of which is that this is the one-story option, um, and there is a two-story option, um, which is the larger version. Uh, each of these spaces has, uh, la again, large windows. Uh, we're focusing on exterior materials, um, as you can see in this image, that are really horizontal siding. We have some uh, shakes that are sort of breaking up and defining a lot of the different masses. Uh, PVC trim components that um, provide a durable element as also sort of a, a, another level of finesse to the, the overall design. Um, and I believe that those are the main materials on the estates. Once we get to the hybrid, we do integrate um, some stone elements as well on the lower levels. Um, this hybrid, as Rob described, is really uh, a product that we, um, we see kind of crossing over from the uh, cottage style living and is sort of a, a different approach to apartment style living. Um, as you can see in plan, we've really taken a lot of, um, of care to break the building down into these three main, main components. Um, the one on the left being a, f a four per floor unit uh, configuration, the one on the right being the mirror image, and then the central building is really the common uh, collected elements in that zone, uh, above which you see uh, some more units. Um, if we jump into the floor plan, you'll kind of get a sense uh, for what the, the overall design layout really is. Um, one would enter from ground level, uh, I'm not sure if you can see behind you, ground level here, um, come into a vestibule location, um, and that's really where there's access to these common functions. To the left, um, you've had, you would have access to a theater that seats uh, 28 individuals, a conference room. Um, a lobby area, and then as you kind of progress up the, pa up the plan, um, there would be access to the left to a fitness component, again, a very you know, vital element to the senior population, uh, and then kind of going down the plan through the, uh, the staircase here um, would be access to the lower level. And on that lower level is where we've allocated the dining component of this project. Um, you can see the rest of the floor plan um, consists of service elements as, that are sort of in gray along uh, this zone here. Uh, and then the parking, underground parking, uh, is the other main component on this level. It's important to note that this would be the side of the building that would be under grade. Um, and then this would be the side that would be exposed uh, to the meadow. This is an exterior perspective that, again, gives sort of a, a, a flavor for the exterior cladding. Um, we are sort of integrating some warmth from some uh, wood look components, and you can see the stone is integrated on the lower levels. Um, we did want to just show a few images. There's been a lot of discussion about the visibility of this project from Spurwink Drive. Um, so this red, or excuse me, purple arrow indicates uh, the view from Spurwink. Um, one of the things that we have sort of in our favor on this site is that there's a bit of a crest right at the entrance to the site. So you can see that even that uh, duplex product to the left is really sort of disguised. Um, and in this perspective, we're not even showing any of the, the low plantings that would be uh, in that area. Um, the hybrid really is this little roof back here, um, right here in the center. If we kind of jump up the page a little bit to the, where the, high, the higher point of the site is, um, the hybrid does become a little bit more visible, but again, it's sort of in, in keeping with the scale of the rest of the single story uh, elements. Um, and really this perspective um, kind of highlights the visibility of that meadow. And we're just really excited, again, that this project uh, offers a lot of diversity to the Piper Shores community. Um, and we're really excited that the prospective re residents would have uh, this opportunity. I'm going to pass it on to Charlie uh, to look at the Covenant to the Trail Network. Hi, good evening. My name is Charlie Katzlovy. I'm a real estate attorney with the law firm of Jensen Baird. And um, if you look at the overall site plan, uh, you'll see in the back of the property the recreational trail area. And I know one of the exciting uh, 
public benefits of this particular project is the network of trails and the public access and the public parking. Um, the contract zone provides for, the amendment provides for the applicant to record a deed restriction in the form of a declaration of covenants that would require the trails in the back of the property in the recreational area to be maintained in perpetuity. Um, so you have the 50-foot uh, uh, buffer areas on the side. That's where uh, the majority of the trail network is found. Um, but in addition, any other trails that wander outside of that 50-foot buffer would be preserved. Um, there would be one area of flexibility, uh, which is there's a trail that bifurcates that uh, recreational area. And if I'm not really on the right slide, but you can kind of see it coming through the middle of the property. Um, it would have to be maintained um, so that there would continue to be a trail bifurcating the recreational area, but it could be relocated to, uh, you know, one side slightly or the other to accommodate um, additional units if and when uh, that, you know, the, the applicant ever came back to this board um, for such a proposal. Um, <clears throat> I'll try to wrap it up quickly here. Um, I would like to um, address some of the items that Jamel uh, suggested be uh, discussed with you. Sorry about that. You want to go back to yours? Yeah, please. Okay. Do I have to plug in? Okay, thank you. Um, so one of the um, one of the comments in the memo was that uh, staff suggested that we show the location of the future units. As you may recall, there's the contract zone uh, request is for 61, and we're proposing 52. And we would love to show you where they would go, but we don't know. Quite honestly, there's no distinct plan for it. They could go near the existing buildings. They could go in the rear. Uh, but we just don't know. <clears throat> also, this approach was suggested by the town um, officials, uh, and the reason is to prevent coming back from multiple amendments to the contract zone. So what we're asking for on the contract is a little bit more density than what we're proposing with this first phase. And, of course, as you know, any such future phase would have to come back to this board for review. Um, the wetland peer review uh, went quite well. You may recall I objected to it when you asked us to do it. Um, but it actually turned out in our favor. One, And they were both in the rear sector of the site. One wetland got a little bit bigger, and one wetland got considerably smaller. So it was actually an improvement for uh, our uh, project. So that was great. Thank you for asking it to be done. Um, Jamel asked to uh, discuss the trailhead parking. Uh, the contract zoning agreement requires five spaces. Uh, we're proposing seven, uh, which we think is adequate, and it's, we point out similar to the Libby River Preserve Trailhead. Okay, and then um, staff suggested adding sidewalks along the main road, connecting the duplexes to the estates. So what this plan shows is what I, what I believe staff is suggesting is to add a sidewalk here in the green section. Again, this is the estates. These are the duplexes. There's an existing sidewalk here that does connect them. Um, but the elevations are important to understand. Again, this is an elderly uh, population. Is that uh, the elevation down here is about 18 feet uh, below here. 
So you, when you come into the site, you come up, but then you drop down quite a bit. What we would suggest is an alignment in blue, which would be more, more or less uh, a gradual um, transition and, and more direct. Uh, the second uh, thing we wanted to talk about was staff had recommended esplanades uh, between the curbing, street curbing, and the sidewalks. And Piper Shores, we had a long conversation about that. And that would create a maintenance issue for them uh, because of snow removal operations. Every spring, that esplanade gets damaged. Um, and it's just much better um, for maintenance to uh, uh, have the sidewalks above the curb. It also protect, protects the light fixtures and the street trees, which are behind the sidewalk, so they're set back from plowing operations. And then the last uh, thing we wanted to talk about was site lighting. This diagram shows in yellow the extent of site lighting. Uh, so at the edge of the yellow, for example, along here, that is where you get to zero foot candles. And we're, again, we're using all full cutoff fixtures, uh, shorter in stature height, and we're not even close to projecting light beyond our property line. So I will close there and thank you, and uh, we're here for questions. Great, thank you. We appreciate that overview. And before we go to board discussion, we do have the opportunity for public comment. I just ask that anyone who would like to speak come to the podium, uh, provide your name and address. Please keep your comments to five minutes or less. Please avoid um, repetition of points <coughs> that have already been made. Um, and just try to be respectful of everyone's time. So with that, I'll open up the podium. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Jones. <clears throat> I live at uh, 14 Acorn Lane, and I'm a direct abutter to this project. And uh, we've, we've submitted a, a letter already for all of the residents of Acorn Lane, which we've signed, that all oppose this project as it's uh, presented tonight. Um, the Con Scarborough Comprehensive Plan and the guiding principles talk about safe and inviting connected systems to the beaches, talks about efficient in infrastructure and connected neighborhood villages. And what, what this project is, is an isolated project that doesn't do any of that. The plan states, uh, the comprehensive plan states that there's, that there's a major lack of connectivity in our town. And it's the solution in the comprehensive plan is to focus future growth on walkability and connective centers. And this is part of the Higgins Beach uh, area. And it's, it, what they're presenting is an isolated project. It doesn't connect to any of the, uh, to Spurwink. There's no sidewalks along Spurwink. It doesn't connect to Higgins Beach. It's going to add traffic. It's going to add more people walking on Spurwink Road. Um, the town has approved projects like Piper Shores, and now they've added more parking at Higgins Beach, and that's all great, but that brings a lot more traffic. It, this is a high recreation area, and Spurwink Road right now is not a safe road, especially in the summertime. Hundreds of bicyclists, pedestrians are walking, and it's a game of chicken right now, trying to get in and out of someone walking or someone, um, a bicycle, and there's a car coming the other way. The residents here are active elderly people. They're going to be walking to, down, to the, down to Ocean Avenue, down to the Higgins Beach Market, and they're going to have to walk down on Spurwink Road. They're not going to cut through the trail system and take a circuitous route around Piper Shores and then back up the sidewalk on Ocean Avenue because it's just down the road three, 400 yards. So this project should have sidewalks along Spurwink Avenue, and it should be should be the start of connecting this neighborhood with the neighborhood of Higgins Beach and making it safer for everybody. There's going to be a lot more traffic and a lot more pedestrians on the road. 
there's been, there's been no improvements to, to Spur Wink Road despite all of this increased traffic and all the recreation. Um, there's been, it's not as wide, it hasn't been improved, <coughs> there's no sidewalks, and it really is, for people who live there, you'll probably hear it from other people tonight, um, you take your life in your own hands, you just, you're happy when you get finally to Ocean Avenue where the town has put a sidewalk, because now you, you feel safe and you can get to the beach. Um, so that is the, that's one of the major impacts of this development, is going to be the increased impact on the surrounding neighborhoods. That's why the neighborhoods, uh, the residents are opposed to this. The project also provides no open space. So it's a 45 acre project and it's providing no open space. They have the trail system, but it's not in a conservation easement. It's not de deeded separately as, ocean, as open space because you know why? Because there's gonna be future development there and they don't wanna do that. So uh, there's no benefit to the town. This is all a wooded area now with trails and uh, there's no guarantee in the future that that's ever going to remain that way. So for the town to approve for a public benefit a, a project with, that's 45 acres with no open space and three times the density that's allowed in that zone is just, um, it, it doesn't even go with the comprehensive plan and it, it's contrary to zoning and the principles of zoning. So. My last comment is on the, is really the hybrid building or the common building. Just, you, we, what we didn't hear tonight was the scope of that building. It is four stories high. It's, it's twice the size as the Comfort Inn on Route 1 in, in Scarborough. This is going to be a huge building, and it's at the highest point on this site. So this is going to be looking down from my house. This is at least the top of this building is 100 feet higher. And I could already see the houses currently, the structure there now from our house. So the, the houses along Acorn Lane can already see the McDonald House, which is a, a 7,000 foot house um, at nighttime with the lights. If we put a building that's 10 times that size, and going to be significantly higher because they're asking for a waiver of the height requirements for the town of Scarborough to 55 feet, I think, the last time I saw it. This is going to be a huge building on the highest point, and it's going to dominate the structure. So we're going to, we have real issues with lights and noise, and the, basically the whole vista uh, is going to change for everybody. And so uh, we're going to be looking at what, what was rural farming and what's zoned for that. We're going to be looking at basically, um, you know, Holiday Inn Express out our backyards uh, now. So that's why that's just three of the reasons why we oppose it. And you'll hear from others tonight, but I just wanted to hit on the three highlights for basically public safety and requiring at least to start that this applicant put sidewalks along Spurwink Road so that they can, for their own resident safety, as well as the people who have to drive on Spurwink Road. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Tim Yeomans. Uh, Newcomb Ridge Road resident, RF zone resident, and we did, uh, myself and my fellow uh, residents of Newcomb Ridge Road, I did send a letter that's on the record. I won't be uh, repeating that, um, except to just point out uh, in one sentence that we just question the purpose of using zoning as a fundraising vehicle. We just don't see anything in the ordinance that says that zoning can be used for, to make changes in zoning in exchange for fees. There's new information regarding wetlands to amplify the uh, concerns we expressed in our letter that's on the record. Uh, in reviewing the materials that the town put up for this, in preparation for this meeting, and we thank the town for that, uh, Sebago Technics Memo 17 July, picture two, uh, refers to a drained field. And yet there's no mapping, no analysis, no accounting for these altered wetlands uh, as compared to the uh, main DEP required uh, base year of 1997, at least from what we can see. Uh, there's clear physical evidence uh, of this altered wetlands. Uh, it's even, there's evidence on the plans uh, of this engineering that has been done to change these wetlands. Um, it seems to us that this is a significant omission. We brought this to the attention of the main DEP when we reviewed the submission that they are looking at right now, and they said that they're going to look into this. Um, that's not, not on the plans right now, at least from our review as laymen. Um, next, 
Uh, we got some confusing uh, details that were on the staff review. And one of the staff review memos refers to this parcel, the Dorado Drive parcel, uh, as RF zoned. On the most recent um, uh, staff review, right at the top, it says, and I quote, location R9 lot 1D5 Dorado Drive zoning district RF contract zone. Well, it's not a contract zone. This, this parcel is completely in the RF zone. The existing contract zone is across <laughs> the street uh, and not, not even part of this parcel at all. And so getting to contract zoning, we feel that it is completely inappropriate for the applicant to apply as a change to their current zone, again, which is down the road and across the street is the contract zone. Uh, if anything, this should be a brand new application. This is a different parcel of land in an RF zone. It's not within their, their current uh, contract zone at all. Regarding contract zoning, I would just like to point out and reinforce um, line uh, from page 104 of the uh, comprehensive plan. Uh, RF zone is a completely within the limited growth sector. The limited growth sector includes areas with limited development that have value as open space where the town desires to see little development but which are subject to development under their current zoning. Now, the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, Section 1.1, the first paragraph on contract zoning, says that contract zoning is authorized when, and I quote, it is consistent with the Town of Scarborough Comprehensive Plan and compatible with existing and permitted uses within the existing zoning district. Well, this, this project fails on all of those. It is not compatible with the existing uh, zoning. The, the applicant is proposing to change the zoning, admitting that it's not compatible with the existing zoning, and it does not respect open space at all. So because it doesn't respect open space, uh, because it asks for a change in the zoning, it is inconsistent with the comprehensive plan, and it, which therefore makes it inconsistent with the contract zoning ordinance itself. You know, in summary, all that we're asking to do here, um, as the residents of the RF zoning district of Newcomb Ridge Road, echoed by some of our other neighbors in, in the RF zoning district, is to have the town, and I paraphrase what we quoted in our letter, uh, enforce the spirit of the criteria for the Zoning Board of Appeals, which is to maintain the essential character of our locality, which I deny that the project is doing and, and the assertion that the CEO made that they are doing, we oppose that assertion. We think that this project is not maintaining the essential character of our locality. And also to maintain a wholesome home environment. That's what, that's what those criteria say. Um, so to the, uh, to the board, we request respectfully that uh, the board disapprove this application for the reasons we have discussed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Scott Townsend, Acorn Lane resident. Uh, I resonate what um, Jeff said as well. Um, I think that this is important. It's been brought to our attention multiple times that uh, Piper Shores has been uh, in front of the planning board for <coughs> amendments over the past few e or past years, and uh, they want to put an end to that. So they're coming forward with a, a proposal, sort of to tie everything together. So I think where this is such a, a big proposal, it needs the attention of, of everybody involved to make sure that all the criteria are being met, so that they don't have to come back again. Uh, and everyone's happy and we walk away with a win-win scenario, which is what I think all of us as a butters want. Um, one of the things that I've been pretty vocal about is where this is such a sizable project, uh, there's numbers that are floating around. There's the 52, which they're asking for to be permitted now. Um, however, with the amendment to the contract zone, they're asking for 61 total units. Um, what I would like to see is where those units are going to be. I know that they say they don't know, um, but they've got some great minds that are working with them um, that can forecast out into the future to see what is going to be the best locale to site either a building or individual homes or duplexes and have that as part of the plan. 
Um, the second thing that I wanted to talk about is um, the density. Uh, currently, it is in an RF zone. Uh, they're looking to triple the density of what could be permitted there if someone was to build a traditional neighborhood development. Uh, and when those have done been done in the past, there's green space and conservation space. Um, so I would like to see that back portion where the trails are, um, which they have actually in a previous rendition. Um, I don't have a copy to pass around, but I do have a previous rendition that shows that area as future development. Uh, and it shows units back there, single family units back there. Um, so I would like to see that actually conserved. Um, that way the trails that are there can be maintained and kept in place without being moved or having them be, if they do develop that in the future, if it's not protected, you could have what's called a trail going through an actual neighborhood. Uh, and that doesn't really feel like being out in nature or being in the woods. Um, again, I um, agree with everything else that Jeff said, so I don't want to be redundant. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, David Whitaker, 12 Acorn Lane. Uh, we are in opposition of this proposal. Uh, I'd first just like to thank the board for the opportunity to be heard tonight, um, as well as for the opportunity to submit a letter on behalf of, uh, just a point of clarification, all of the residents of Acorn Lane uh, in opposition of um, this, pro uh, this proposal. Uh, again, not to um, reiterate or, or restate what Jeff um, or Scott have said previously, but just to reaffirm that I'm in complete agreement with their position. Um, and then really just look for more active neighborhood engagement from Piper Shores, more transparency. We heard a couple of points here today with respect to the future permits, um, um, the maintenance building there or not there, um, just more transparency as good corporate partners that we know they are, um, and the willingness from our neighborhood in Acorn Lane to work with them for a workable solution for all. Uh, and again, um, I think Jeff and Scott covered um, um, from Acorn Lane's viewpoint, our position, and again, we are in opposition, and I thank you all for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for uh, hearing my com comments. Uh, my name is Bob Yensha. I live at 9 Stone Ridge Drive. There are three of us on Stone Ridge Drive at the top of the hill, and I believe everybody on Newcomb Ridge Road is in the same boat. We're all on wells. My well is borderline functional, I, and I've only been in that house four years. I just built it four years ago. So I'm concerned about water quality being maintained and uh, water supply as well with all of the blasting. We're all on a ridge there that is extremely friable. So I've been working with a hydrogeologist to understand what baseline studies I need to do now on uh, well recovery, water supply, and water quality. But I'm concerned that with the amount of uh, earth movement that's going to go in, putting in an underground garage on that ledge, what that's going to do to the water supply. So, and I understand from Portland Water District, when I built my house, coming up to the top of that, ri to, to the top of that hill on Stone Ridge where those three houses are that are on wells there, is not possible for like tens of thousands of dollars because there's that big ledge that goes right across our road. At this point, retrofitting our houses wouldn't be cheap either. And, I, and I've expressed that to uh, folks, they've heard that, but I haven't heard any more than it'll be fine, and I'm really concerned about that. So, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name's Lucia DeMarco Jones. I'm at 14 Acorn Lane. I've been there for 21 years. So I've seen the history and the cycle of when Piper Shores first came into development for the town. I remember years ago when Piper Shores came before you and there was a lot of controversy at that time when they first came in for that application. Now it's many years later and they have a wonderful community there and I see that they do have a three year waiting list to get in. And they've had meetings with, um, with some of us as neighbors, but I will say that I feel like the transparency, um, you know, as they've had some meetings and they've really presented their plan, but they have not heard us. Um, they have really stuck to their plan. Um, they said in the, one of the first meetings it was going to be 61 units. Now it's down to 52. The maintenance garage is there. It's not there. You know, we're really looking for transparency, and I really feel like some of the things that we have brought to their attention have been dismissed. 
And um, as a parent, I have uh, raised my children on that street. And to be honest with you, my children would never cross that street until they were 14 years old. That is, in the summertime, is 45 to 50 miles an hour on that road. As a pedestrian, you cannot just have a child on that road at all. And as it's grown in popularity with surfers, all of the things that have happened, even within our street, our street, as you, you may or may not know this, but Acorn Lane was a free parking lot for uh, Higgins Beach until the parking was resolved and we had to have signs put up and all that. So there's been a lot of things as we are a nearby street, there's a lot of impact because of Higgins Beach and its popularity. And I will say that part of the comprehensive plan, <coughs> um, to, you know, to really take a look at this project in its scale and size um, is a huge impact to us as abutters. It's 120 people, if it's at 61 units, uh, six, you know, 61 spots, that looks like 120 people living behind us with cars. Um, and as it's not just, I would say anything between Black Point Road to Pleasant Hill Road is the most dangerous road right now in the summertime. There's a very dangerous curve, as you know, just going past Acorn Lane to, to, to Pleasant Hill. It's a blind curve. There's absolutely nowhere uh, to go with a bike or anything. And so I'm just asking the, the planning board to really take a serious look at the overall project and how it impacts us short term and long term because this is a very permanent structure uh, that's, that's changing with these contract zones. So the height of the building, that's the 28 apartments, is significant. The lighting is significant. There's no open space behind us. Um, and the traffic, when we have raised some of these things to, to them in some of these meetings, these concerns have been dismissed and saying that it's the problem of the town to fix, not theirs. So I really, um, you know, just want to point out a couple of these things. It has been increasing. Um, you know, our neighborhood has really increased in popularity, which is great, but at the same time, we really feel that as, as uh, people that we're paying taxes, we haven't seen anything happen to our benefit for the safety of the residents, short term or long term. So I really hope that you um, listen to us and take uh, many of these things under consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Jackson, 6 8 Corn Lane. Uh, I won't belabor many of the points that my neighbors have already kind of put forth in front of you. Um, I kind of agree with them that we are in opposition for the reasons that they've already discussed, namely uh, seeking a pretty uh, impressive exception from the, the rules as they already are, which we expect to have significant increases, in not only traffic, but just global volume of people that are in that area. And as has already been reiterated, it's Russian roulette walking down that road every day. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, my name is Chris Avantaggio. Um, I live on 10 Acorn Lane. I'm a direct abutter of the property. Um, I'm not going to try and reiterate what my neighbors have said. Uh, as a direct abutter, I have real concerns around the height of the building. I can see the house now, and uh, it, it's just going to be huge from, from our line of sight. Uh, it's going to be like a castle on top of a hill. Um, and, and just have concerns about the sheer scale of it. I'll also say as a father of three young boys, a six-year-old, a five-year-old, and a two-year-old, it's already pretty scary walking down to Higgins Beach as it is. The crosswalk lights that were put up a few years ago are really the only thing that saves you from crossing the street down there. So the increase in traffic from this project is, is going to be very noticeable, and it's pretty scary. So thank you for your time. Thank you. My name's Donald Simino. My wife, Lisa Newcomb, and myself have uh, lived on Newcomb Bridge for longer than anybody else has been in the area. Uh, we've seen a lot of changes. We've seen Wildwood, Stone Ridge, Acorn Lane all come along never ever opposed any of that that's what our area is zoned for and it's uh, the nice homes all in these areas um, this thing triple quadruple the density i think it's a lousy idea <laughs> piper shores already has a, a, a big huge complex down there they want much of the same up where we are um, it just i've never been naive enough to think that land would never be developed it was in the family and, but I always pictured it being developed like our lots, my neighbor's lots, and all the lots in our areas, two acres, and uh, have some little bit of privacy, seem nice homes, not this big mess that they're proposing. Um, I, my opinion, obviously. I, I would think that you, 
Piper Shores go to an area that's zoned for something like they, they want to build, but uh, instead of uh, devastating our area for the most part, I guess that's all I have to say. So, thank you for hearing me. Thank you. I'll be quick. My name is Brooks Juring. I live on Stone Ridge Drive. Um, I heard something today, and I really appreciate and respect what you guys do and how much you care about what things look like from the road. And I, and I understood, you know, you wanted to see what it looks like from Spurwink Road. Now imagine yourself with the residents of about 20 of us, 30 of us, looking at this four or five story monstrosity. It's so out of place. It's very unnecessary to be that much if it's gonna be that much. So please think, if you're concerned about what it looks like from Spurwink, which it seems minimal, now go walk around this land. It's beautiful woods. Uh, it's a really amazing space that we can all appreciate, so I encourage you to go look at it and then put yourselves in our shoes as respective uh, ownership, owners of the house. The McDonald family, I recall, partnered up with Camp Ketcha five, six years ago to save the rabbits, and they did a significant amount of tree cutting uh, to create certain amount of brush on the McDonald family's home exactly, as well as, well as uh, um, Camp Ketcha. And so it just seems funny, like, how much work was done and for basically no cost. And it seems like there was a little pro quid quo. I could be wrong saying that, but, um, you know, getting the trees cut down for a project of this sorts. Sorry if I uh, offend anyone there. Lastly, and I think most importantly for the people that live in this neighborhood, is it is a significant amount of ledge and all of us have foundations and all of us have basements and if i'm not mistaken if we speak to some of my neighbors on stone ridge drive when the piper shores um, built their um, property on the other side of the road uh, there was some foundation issues and there was no one to go to and it was a debacle so i need to uh, hopefully get some reassurance from all of you that if, there, if this project does go forward and we're talking about a, a ledge that's going to be blasted for the underground parking garage, uh, are we going to be reassured that our foundations, if they do crack, will be replaced properly? Because that's not a pretty picture. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mike Diggins, uh, 11 Acorn Lane. Uh, Pretty much agree with everything everybody said. Um, this has been pretty informative. I learned some things I didn't know, um, which has been helpful in understanding this. Um, come out to the land if you have time and walk on it and walk up the hill where that uh, building will be built, and you'll see that it's um, it's pretty high. So uh, it doesn't fit the picture. It doesn't fit the landscape. Um, but come out and take a look. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bill Fox. I'm at 18 Acorn Lane. Uh, two main things that concern me. Uh, number one is I'm on uh, Spurwing all the time. I walk there, ride bikes. <clears throat> Basically, it is just as it is. You have to be so careful of traffic. During the summer months, it's horrible. This time of year, it's still a fair amount of traffic, even uh, even around rush hour, et cetera. When they're doing this uh, new development, you know, what we heard uh, during the presentations that they'd given us was that it was really not going to affect traffic to any great degree. We talked about maybe one or two trips a day. Well, here, you know, you're looking at um, elderly individuals, but these are the people who are independent. So they're people who really are expected to be out in the community. They're going to be going to the store. They're going to be going, they may be going to the main Piper Shores campus, but they're also going to be going out on a regular basis. These are not people that you can really expect. You're just going to be staying at the homes. So you have, by the numbers that they have, you know, you can have 61 different uh, homes there. So that's maybe 120 cars, that's what they're, uh, from what I've heard, they're basically planning the uh, building so that each 
uh, dwelling has two cars. Well, I could see easily with that a few trips per day with each of those cars. And uh, if you add that on to what the traffic is right now, that's just going to be intolerable. Uh, it's just an accident waiting to happen on, uh, on Spur Wink. Again, right now, it's, it's during, especially during the summer months, it's really dangerous, especially as you get down to the corner where the uh, market is. Um, there's that long straightway before that. Speed limit's 45. People come whipping through there, and it's not a pretty situation. We are direct uh, abutter at the end of the road. We also back up right onto the, uh, where the trail network is. We actually have trails running through our yard that go back there. And I'm really concerned that this is really going to have quite an impact back there. We go, we're back there uh, you know, all year round. It's a great area for getting out and snowshoeing, uh, cross-country skiing in the winter. And losing that area, having more of that develop, is really just going to be a real loss for that area. It's a, it's a beautiful area to go back there as it is uh, with the limited development that is there. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Going once, twice. <coughs> all right, well, thank you very much. We appreciate all that, all that input and that you waited this long <laughs> to have your opportunity. Um, so with that, we'll turn to board discussion. And um, anybody want to volunteer to go first? <laughs> Rachel. Sure. Um, as I listened, uh, I have some familiarity with the, uh, with the area. When uh, my husband and I first moved here up from DC, um, we took a look at buying a house on Stone Ridge. So uh, I am uh, I'm familiar with the area and the, the large rocks going across. The, as I hear the, the comments from folks, I, I guess I end up um, with two real concerns that I have uh, about the project. I, while I think there are, there are items that can be worked out between Piper Shores and the abutters, um, in, in good discussions. I, I think the areas that we need to take a look at, uh, one that Piper Shores has an ability to look at, and that is the, the ground on which that larger building is going to be built, and the ledge, and how much excavation is going to be needed, and the impact that it might have upon neighboring houses. Now, we've heard that uh, upon the houses, uh, concerns about the wells, I think that's something that um, that Piper Shores needs to look at in order to satisfy the folks, the abutters, that there is not going to be damage. I think the question that also seemed, uh, one of the issues that also seemed to run through the, the comments is the size of the comments. Really didn't hear issues about the duplexes um, or the estate. Uh, houses, but certainly the uh, commons and the apartments building, there was real questions about the height and the bulk. Uh, and I think it would be important for Piper Shores to take another look at that, uh, if necessary, to provide better, um, better plans so that, or uh, views, so that the neighbors could, could be clear on what the impact is going to be on them in terms of, <clears throat> of height, in terms of what their viewpoint is. And Piper Shores needs to take a look at whether a building that size is really required out there. The other issue that I continue to hear, I'm not sure is something necessarily that Piper Shores can do, but perhaps they can in concert with the town, and that is how do we get sidewalks out on Spurwink so that people walking along there, whether they're from this development or from some of the developments along Spurwink Road, where people can walk without fear for their lives. Uh, whether it's uh, adding to traffic control, adding to sidewalks, uh, considering traffic soothing measures. Uh, it seems to me that that's Spurwink Road itself is an issue that's in the purview of the town. 
but now may be the time before this gets going really to take a look at what can be done with it. That's my suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Rick? So I guess I have a quick question for um, staff. So, or, or I think what uh, we uh, what are we being asked for tonight? I mean, this is a preliminary subdivision review, but is it part of the contract mm -hmm. to the town council? I mean, part of the input to the town council for this yes. contract zone? Yep, this is part of a contract zone amendment okay. process. So that that's what I thought, but yeah. I couldn't tell exactly from the way I. I was reading it. So, um, so until we give the preliminary subdivision approval, it doesn't really move any further along at the town council. Okay. It might be helpful if staff could, for the benefit of the board as well as those those who are here or watching, to just kind of briefly outline what is it that sub preliminary subdivision approval sort of fixes in terms of the project characteristics, understanding that there um, would still be other things to to work out. Sure. Uh, essentially, preliminary um, approval fixes the development pattern, if you will. You know, is the board comfortable with the general direction things are headed? Now, um, ultimately, the council has, as I think you've already alluded to, Mr. Chair, uh, ultimately has the discretion to build in any other um, elements um, in the contract zone um, that would modify the zoning, um, uh, ex underlying zoning requirements. Um, but typically the preliminary approval is, as I said, it's really an opportunity for the board and applicant to work through the preliminary design, have a good sense that we're comfortable with the development pattern per the proposal, and then the board other, other um, component, and, and I guess that first one really gets to what you said at the outset, I think, of maybe the other contract zone is really, you know, that that's looking at the subdivision review standards. Now, the other thing that the board has the ability to do, and it's embedded in the contract zone process, is weigh in on the contract zone itself and what you're, so, so there's really sort of two, two different things happening there. You know, one is 51 units currently proposed with a total of 62 units. You know, how does that fit our current subdivision ordinances? That's sort of the first bit. And then also, um, as I was starting to say, the second component is weighing in on the actual, um, uh, those type of amendments, the increased densities and, and the uh, differential use types. Again, we're in the RF zone, which typically allows for only single family homes, not apartment style. Um, so um, I think that's really the Thanks. Thanks. Back Thanks, that was really helpful. I think it's probably helpful for everybody else, too. So, you know, anybody who's watched me on TV, and I know you all do, um, you know, I've I probably said a hundred times since I've been up here, um, if you buy a piece of land in Scarborough and you follow the rules, and we've got a big rule book somewhere, I don't have mine with me tonight, but you should be able to build what you want, okay? So if there's a piece of land next to your house and, and the TVC three zone allows that you can build a duplex there, but you don't want someone to build a duplex there, then you should buy that piece of land and don't build a duplex there. In this particular case, the way I understand it is we're being asked to um, provide input to the town council to, to change the rules so that we can, um, you know, that something can be built here that normally might not be able to be built here. So I think based on um, what I've seen for plans, and there's a whole, there's a really good section on stormwater here. Really? Outstanding <coughs> job on stormwater. Um, but what I've heard from the public and what I know of that piece of property, I've lived out there a few times, I've uh, rented a house out in Higgins a couple of times for the winter. Uh, I lived on Oakhurst Drive for a little while. Used to run Sperlink Road. And yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting. Um, <laughs> and taking a bike out there, that's even, that's not even the same. Um, 
So yeah, I'm not I'm not in favor of uh, moving anything to the town council until we get a better idea of. You know, I read in the literature that they're that they're um, the stormwater ponds are twice as big as they need to be for anticipated future development or something to that effect. But um, yeah, I'm I don't have enough information here, and and I think that. If we're going to make this a contract zone and, and approve something here that normally wouldn't be approved, there's got to be some benefit to the people that live in that area. <clears throat> and we have to have another meeting. And most of these people that we saw here tonight have to come up and say they're OK with it. That's before we change anything. That's my thoughts. Thanks, Rick. <clears throat> Robin? Uh, yeah, I think I agree with um, my colleagues that I think we need to reevaluate <clears throat> the contract zone um, uh, agreement. And I, I am that person who saves my notes from the last time you all were here. And I think my comment was, if this is the fourth or fifth, third or fourth amendment, why am I still looking at the second amendment to the contract zone agreement in here? And I had that same comment back on July 16th, and it looks like it's the same contract zone. So, um, so I think we need to. I, I think the public benefit uh, that's offered here does need to offset the, the impacts, and um, I think there there's been plenty of. If, if the, con if the uh, project wants to move forward, there's plenty of benefit here that can be taken advantage of, whether it's the sidewalks on Spurwink, the, um, and, and I understand this is probably outside the urban compact area, and so we're talking about dealing with DOT in addition to the town. So the, that sort of um, makes it a little more complex, I understand, but there's definitely room for public benefit when it comes to exploring that, the safety and traffic impacts on Spurwink. But as um, Ms. Ms. Hendrickson said, the, uh, the ledge and potential impacts and making sure that we have assurances for damages, whether it's to water supplies or foundations, I think is something that definitely needs to be taken a look at. And like um, Mr. Duperry said, understanding that the rule changes that are going to the town council need to be for a reason. And that reason, if you look at the contract zone ordinance, is for a public benefit. And so, um, because I can't help myself, I, I'm also going to ask that we explore um, some of the other issues that were brought up um, between now and then, including the wetlands. Um, I know some folks were sort of intonating that they may have been, it may have been a drained field or whatever. If that was for agricultural purposes, because you are an RF, I believe RF is rural farming, correct? So if those were for agricultural purposes, you may be out of luck there. Whatever happens in ag sometimes gets forgotten in the wetland um, industry. So, um, but somebody brought up something else, which was New England cottontail habitat. And I don't know if anybody has looked into the New England cottontail habitat, the connectivity and what's per prescribed there. That's something that um, I don't know that I've seen it in there. Will it may be in there? I apologize, but um, but that's for to me these issues that I'm talking about here are are small potatoes compared to the public benefit <coughs> that that the town council needs to weigh in on. And unfortunately, we don't make that decision as to what's the appropriate public benefit here. Okay, all we can weigh in on is oh, we're hearing that some of the public benefit may be X, Y, and Z. So really that's a discussion for you know, the town council and, and the like. Um, but, but again, what I'd like to see is the contract zone agreement as it would meant to be revised. And I think somebody brought up a really good point too that, that is it even legal to take the contract zone agreement and expand it beyond its current geographic um, and spatial elements kind of a thing and I don't necessarily need the anybody to weigh in on it now I'm just raising it as something that should be considered I also have back in July that um, that the applicant disagreed on three points um, with the with respect to staff the pedestrian crossing which I'm excited to see in there 
but some of the reasons that we were talking, we were talking about the other two things were the conservation easement and uh, wetlands vernal pool peer review. So thank you for doing the wetlands um, peer review, but I'm wondering if vernal pools got lost in there or if anybody took a look for it. With respect to conservation easement, I'm, I'm wondering, does, does that still apply here? And then third, um, the pedestrian crossing. We heard, I heard from the applicant tonight, the team, that putting esplanades between the, the road and the sidewalk are a winter maintenance issue, but then I saw that the, cro that the sidewalk is actually going into the property and around this way. So that seems a little inconsistent with me, and I don't necessarily need you to address it tonight, but just understand um, the consistencies that I'll be looking for there. Um, I think a, another really good point that was brought up tonight is the connectivity to Higgins Beach and avoiding this building an isolated um, system because I know that like you can go and drive into Piper Shores, but I never have. I go to Higgins Beach all the time, but you don't go to Piper Shores. So I think integrating the neighborhoods and the connectivity I think was a really important, intriguing concept. Um, and then the pattern of development. So I guess I, I've spoken to some of the patterns of development, whether it's connectivity, and Rachel had mentioned the bulk, and I'm saying, you know, are we, are we um, isolating habitat and the like? So I think that's all the elements I have, but I think we have our work cut out for us here. Thanks. Nick? Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna, um, either Jamel or Jay, just kind of a couple leading questions for you. Um, when we look at a project like this, um, we know it's in an RF zone, right? But they're going contract zone amendment. So this kind of, it obviously doesn't fit into the definition of what they're going to do. So what is it, what are the standards I'm supposed to be holding as I look at the actual development? What are the standards that I should be holding it to. You know, should I be comparing it to a typical RF where your setbacks are X, your, you know, multi-houses are? Well, that's, I think this is part of the problem with what I'm seeing here is, what am I, you know, when I look and tell you my thoughts on this development and how it's laid out and whether or not there's enough setback or maybe there's not enough, what am I, what am I using as my yardstick? So I guess the, um, obviously, you know, they're going for uh, more density than would typically be allowed in different uses. So this isn't your typical RF um, subdivision as you, you know, I think as you're alluding to where we typically look for sort of our conservation subdivision design, right, with 50% open mm -hmm. space. But I do think that's um, certainly an element that if you have concerns about are, are worth bringing up. But I think I would really sort of be reviewing this in terms of the subdivision review standards, in terms of, um, uh, you know, stormwater traffic and it's sort of, you know, through the subdivision ordinance, we had there's sort of 18 or so criteria that the board looks at, wastewater, um, adequacy of drinking water and all those sorts of elements. Um, so I think that's in terms of sort of the <coughs> impacts, right, that's really what that looks at. In terms of design, it's really referring back to what the, the contract zone is allowing for, which is the increased density and use types. Um, so. so, and please, please correct me if I'm not reading this correctly. I'm looking at this plan, but I really don't have a yardstick. I don't have anything other than the contract zone that was approved the first time, the second time, or the third time, or the fourth time, that would tell me that there's five feet minimum setback somewhere. Like that's, I don't have anything other than what's in that contract zone. And if the contract zone doesn't say anything about minimum setbacks, what do I fall back to? Like what, what's my default? So um, the way most contract zones are written is that the underlying zone carries and then the contract zone is a, basically lies on top of that and where, where explicit supersedes it. Um, so, um, Typically, we have a, I think it's a 50-foot front yard setback in the, in the RF. They're talking about a 200-foot setback. Typically, we have a 15-foot side and rear. I believe they're talking about a 50-foot, if I'm not mistaken. Um, typically, we say one unit per two acres. They're probably at about two or three units per acre. Um, I'm not entirely sure what it is, but, you know. Right. So, 
and, I, and maybe in a, a roundabout way, what I'm really getting at here is that um, instead of going, and, and this is where the real rub is for me, you, you had a piece of property that was here, it was by itself, and it, it's somehow now become an amendment to an existing contract zone. And I, I'm not convinced it wasn't an end around on just wiping the slate clean on an RF property, which we could very well in the future see come in with 20 units on it at two acres a piece or even a sub, you know, a conservation subdivision type of plan where at least half of that property, or not half, but ends up in, in conservation. And, and I feel, you know, I feel looking at this, one, I, I feel like this kind of an, an end around. On, on our rules mm -hmm. is what this really it circumvents what we've been trying to do. Now, we actually allow that here in town. That's actually something we do. It's called the contract zone. You can do an end around, but there's got to be a public benefit, right? But we as this board don't really weigh in on a public benefit. So the only thing I really can comment on looking at this is I would just tell everyone in this audience that they should be in front of the town council about this project. And I'm sorry if I'm back up on the soapbox, but <coughs> this this coming to me as, um, as an RF project, could be the same owners for all I care, um, would give me more clarity on what it is I'm, tr I'm looking at in the sense of what's appropriate for what's out there. It was zoned RF for a reason. When we change zones, there's a process. I feel like, I feel like this one, it's housing, and I'm, I like to take things at its face value. Um, the public benefit here is more housing, is what this is, and I'm not convinced Scarborough has a lack of housing. So, where's my public benefit? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not there. So, uh, enough of me. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Roger. Um, well, I think I think um, everything's been exhausted here in terms of the discussion. I mean, the, the, the abutters have very legitimate concerns. I think um, I'm kind of curious when when the town council did their initial. This is a procedural mm -hmm. question, Chair mm -hmm. Jamal. When the town council did their preliminary. Um, <coughs> You know, meeting on um, on this contract zone. Are they are they essentially saying that they're they uh, they agreed to the idea of a contract zone at, at this location? Yep. Yep. And, and, and then they're they're leaving it up to us to so we can assume that that they're okay with the contract zone concept in this location. Then it's up to us to determine whether this project can meet all the other. Criteria. Assuming, let's say that this project was going, going to be located in a zone that allowed this project, mm -hmm. okay, and there was no contract on. That's how we're supposed to operate. Yep. Yeah. So I, I think it's, um, you know, sort of along the lines of what Nick was asking about would be um, an example might be if for some reason you know this board found that they couldn't adequately address uh, issues related to stormwater. You know that that's a that's the, the <coughs> impact of the development, and that gets to the subdivision review standards. I think that that's the type of thing that um, the board um, is really being tasked with looking at. Because correct, I mean this development is something different that wouldn't otherwise be allowed, but for the applicant has gone to the council, made their pitch for a different type of development pattern, made their pitch for what they perceive as a, an appropriate public benefit, and council has. Um, saw fit to at least move it through their first sort of step. Council, you know, that's, so council, when they first received this sort of says, okay, we can, we can generally see that th there might be a pathway forward for this, so keep going forward, or they can tell the um, um, applicant that, you know, you know, we just don't see any way of this moving forward. And actually, I think we were, we're all part of a recent conversation similar to that where a contract zone came forward and council thought that, you know, they just didn't see a pathway. So here, so far, the council has suggested that they see a pathway based on the development pattern that's being proposed and the benefits that are being proposed. And it, I'll just offer to through the chair that it may be worth, because I have heard it a few times, asking the applicant to sort of uh, describe what they have so far uh, 
talked about as far as their public benefit and that's embedded in the contract zone. But you know, I just sort of offer that through the chairs. Um, sure. Because I've heard you. that being a concern that what is it? And um, so I don't know if that was more of a, uh, a, a, a real question because we don't know what it is or if you're mm -hmm. just not satisfied with what it is. And I, so without trying to read into what it meant, I just put it on the table. <laughs> Let me ask you this then. Um, should we as a board be concerned whether this is the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, or the Fifth Amendment of this contract zone? Is that, that's not part of our issue, that's a town council issue? I, I guess I'm not sure I follow entirely. Well, it's, been, it's been brought up, it's been discussed about, like Nick just mentioned it, you know, and about um, whether they're kind of certain Certain. Oh, whether well, it should be an amendment or a yeah. standalone contract yeah. zone. Yeah. Um, I know our town attorney reviews all the contract zones that come forward, so um, that those type of issues, whether this you know is allowed to be an amendment or should be its own standalone, those that issue is being looked at. But I'm wondering, is that our responsibility or is that the town council? That's really that's primarily on the town council. But again, as I said before, um, the 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 language in the zoning ordinance does have a provision about plan board through this process, giving your opinion on sort of the, the merits, if you will, of the of the contract zone. I can pull up that language for you if you like, but I mean, there is sort of a, a two-step process here for the board, if you will. It's that preliminary review based on the um, site impacts, and then there's also the um, comment back to council as to uh, the contract zone itself. Well, well, what my two cents is worth is, um, I actually took a ride up on Newcomb Ridge the other day, and it's a great piece of property. And um, and I think this project is is you know a very interesting project. But I at the same time I think there's a lot of questions raised by the abutters, um, whether it's mm -hmm. drinking water or, or, or drilling or, or blasting or whatever it is. There's a lot of questions. Spur weight. I, I think I, I'm down that area a lot as well. And that is very dangerous down there, especially in the summertime. People cross the street, especially where the market is there. It's um, so, and I do tend to think that the people who will be living here, unlike maybe at the, at the at the main campus, might be more mobile and more more about, you know, out and about than maybe the ones down at the main campus. So there's just a lot of questions. Um, I I was glad to see on the landscape plan. There's a lot of buffering. You know, on the west side, which would be where Newcomb Ridge is, because that is very, that's just all open right there. I mean, it's, it's wide open spaces. Um, so, robust <coughs> buff buffering would certainly be a requirement there. The only other, other thing I'd just like to clarify is uh, I recall the, uh, when you folks were before us before and you talked to, about the hybrid building, uh, you know, I'm under the impression that that was going to be down in the lower area of the site, and the abutters were talking about it being on a high portion of the site. So I thought it would be in the low area. That's why you wouldn't see much of it. But So that's the only. OK. Thanks. All right. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> so did I mention I'm a lame duck? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, this has been a very, I think, a very beneficial presentation and conversation. It may not end up being satisfactory to, to everyone. Uh, my sense of it is that we're, is that we're gonna leave this tonight without any um, sort of clear outcome in terms of preliminary subdivision and site plan approval. Um, there are obviously, there are a lot of questions here. I will, I do wanna say at the top that um, as, as was noted by at least one of the, one of the uh, neighbors, we don't have any reason to think that Piper Shores has not been an excellent neighbor in their existing um, in their existing form. Um, they've got a beautiful property, very well managed. Um, I actually really like what I've seen of the proposed architecture and the overall project layout here. I think it's very thoughtful, um, and I think it's I think it uh, you know for what it's worth, I think it does meet a real uh, housing need in our community. Um, I also want to make clear that I, I, you know, and we we do grapple with this periodically, where um, wherever the wherever the proposal is around town, there, 
given the nature of this town, there are always pre-existing issues there with traffic or, or what have you, and, and we, don't, um, we don't ask you know, the latest applicant through the door to solve all those problems. Now that said, we do need to think about the, the uh, marginal impact of, of additional units especially the number of units that we're talking about here. So I think it is fair to think about that. Um, you know, whether it ends up, you know, whether the, this board ultimately concludes or whether the council some, uh, ultimately concludes that um, the applicant should somehow be required to extend the sidewalk by the way to Higgins Beach, I don't know. It seems unlikely, but I think it's a fair concern to raise. And like everyone else here, I've experienced that road. And, um, you know, it is a, a valid concern. Um, you know, typically with these things, when we have we have a presentation from the from the applicant, we have public comment, we have board discussion, then often there will be some back and forth between the board and the applicant, and the applicant has a chance to sort of rebut in some cases or address some of the concerns raised. Um, you know, given the hour here and the fact that we've been sitting here for over four hours, um, and we've been on this topic now for well over an hour, I'm going to suggest that we really sort of pause this and that we give the applicant an opportunity to um, you know, prepare responses and, um, a, and both to public comment and to, and to the board's comments and questions and, um, and that we sort of continue this at a, at a future time. And, and I, I also think partic particularly with regard to um, you know, certain proposed elements, including the, the hybrid building and concerns around height there and, and sight lines. It's obviously not a great time of the year to be talking about sight walks, especially since <laughs> winter seems to be here early this year. Um, but I'll just throw that out there as a, as a, as a thought, um, because I think this is the type of situation where in the past we have done that to give folks a sense, a better sense of the lay of the land um, for people who have not been out there and may not be directly familiar with it. And one of the advantages is to doing it when the leaves are down is that you really see, um, you know, you, you, you see the worst case scenario, so to speak, in terms of what's <coughs> visible through the, through the trees. So again, I know it's, uh, and, and by all means, I'm, I'm the chair, but I don't control whether motions come forward or how people vote if someone wants to put forward a motion for preliminary subdivision and site plan approval. Um, that's that's uh, everyone's prerogative, but I, I'm not sensing that we're quite there. And um, I guess I would leave it at that. Rachel? Yeah, I, I don't have a motion. Um, but as as you started to talk, I, one area of public benefit occurred to me, and that's something that we dealt with earlier um, in this meeting. And that is uh, one public benefit of this might be to set aside some of these apartments or duplexes as affordable housing. We have a lot of seniors in Scarborough who cannot otherwise afford uh, something is really as beautiful as is presented through Piper Shores. And uh, looking at uh, issues of affordability there um, might be a very good public benefit to propose. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I might, I just state that that is one of the public benefits that's being proposed. However, I think there, with discussion at council, there was some discussion about making some of the units available. Um, but I think the, the direction has been to go with an in lieu fee. Um, and so that language is written into the contract zone, the proposed contract zone language, I should say. Um, I think consistent with, or at least similar to, um, sort of the, the ratio, I think, that was used up at the Beacon uh, contract zone. Um, well, and in, in, in lieu fee does not particularly or immediately provide um, apartments for people. Sure. So uh, I would strongly urge them to look at the actual uh, facilities, affordable facilities, rather than in lieu. Now, the town council is going to you know, have what it wants, but um, I think we need more affordable uh, facilities for our seniors. Thank you. Um, so again, I mean, I, I think, um, and, and this happens periodically, I think we've, I'm sensing we've kind of reached a point of diminishing utility here in terms of our ability to ha really hash things out. Um, 
and we could spend a couple more hours sitting here um, with the applicant. And I, I'm by no means suggesting that, you know, that, that uh, this can't eventually get there, but there's, I think there's more work to be done. I think the board and the staff are more than capable of, of, of going through that process. And I do appreciate, as others have noted, I appreciate the responsiveness and the thoughtfulness of the, of the applicant's team and, and uh, responding to prior comments. And again, also, we appreciate the public comment as well. So I hope, hope folks understand uh, kind of where we are on that. And I guess to be continued, unless anyone else has any, anything to add. I just, I just have a question. So just to be clear, and maybe so the public is clear, the plan is that the applicant will come back with a um, with information to address some of the comments and the questions that that the public and the, the board had tonight, and present. I guess the big thing here is everybody we're talking about public benefit of the contract zone, so that would be most likely be part of their presentation as to. I, I would anticipate that that would be part of it, and I think too. Um, I'll you know, take the opportunity to say that um, I, I, it would be helpful to hear a little more about, you know, there were some comments this evening about transparency and communication with the butters and, um, and, you know, we'll take that at face value, but I think it would be helpful to have a little better understanding of maybe an update on, on neighborhood engagement and, and, and where that all is, and we encourage the applicant to continue to, to, uh, to do that as appropriate. And I'll just throw in there, um, I don't know if it was caught by the applicant, but an elevation from Sperwick showing the, the large building out back with the, yes, what the right. elevation would look like from right. road. That was in the staff comments, and I, that's, it's good to highlight that. Actually, I, would, um, that's not, I, want, I wanted to mention something else, but I, I think an um, elevation from um, Newcomb Ridge also would be kind of interesting to see. Because um, so from there, so you could actually, for a site view, you know, if you wanted to go up there, you could drive up Newcomb, Newcomb Ridge and you can see the whole, the whole place. And, uh, but anyways, um, during the, um, the uh, comment period tonight, there were a few people who made comments about, they said they're not listening to us, mm -hmm. you know. So it might be beneficial for those people to write down specifically what their concerns are or what they're proposing to give the right. applicant a chance to re rebut to the, you know, those. Right. You know. No, I think, I think that's a, that's a nice thought. And I, I, and keeping in mind that as we well know, from sitting up here and doing a lot of listening, uh, sometimes people unfortunately come away with the impression that we're, that they're not being heard just because we may, you know, the, the, there may not be direct, uh, direct response or capitulation to, to their position. So listening doesn't always mean the same thing as agreeing. Mm. And so um, I think we all appreciate that. But that's a good comment. Did you have something else, well, I was Jack? just going to ask, uh, there was some mention of a site visit. I mean, is there general interest by the board to do a site visit? Or just since it came up? As long as it's before Corey leaves. Oh, it's before Corey leaves. I, I would make a, um, just a comment on that. I, I like that idea of the site visit, but I, I've been on a couple now, and on a, on a project of this scope, I'd actually want some things flagged out, and I don't know if they're, you know, I, the, the four corners of every duplex, for example, or whatever it happens to be, so that we're not just walking around out in the snow saying, oh, that's going to go over here, and this is going to go over there. I really, you know, if, if they're looking for a, a, a variance on a height, um, of a building, I want to see physically how big that building is, and then so just just a, a thought. I, I like the idea of the site visit, and but I just thought I'd throw that out there so that the right. architects or whatever can have and time to go put some stakes in the snow. That typically can be done. And the ground's froze now, so it's hard to get those stakes. In. If yes. I recall, if I recall when the original Pipe of Shores was being discussed. They had balloons out, right? They had balloons out, you know, because people were concerned that they were going to be able to see the original Piper Shores from, um, from Sperwick Road. So I think, especially with the hybrid building, if we want to do a site walk, 
if they were to use some balloons to, you know, you know, describe how high that's going to be and where it's going to be located, uh, that would be the mo that seems to be the most controversial of the buildings. I think yeah, that's a good thought. We can kind of leave that to staff and the applicant to discuss offline. We will get a non-windy day, you know. Right. <laughs> well, we also have to find out where some of these folks live so that we can see from their house what they're going to see. You know, I mean, it's. <laughs> Because we're not just talking about what it looks like when we're standing there. We're well, I mean, it, like for better or worse, <coughs> for better or worse, we have recent experience with uh, yeah. gauging <laughs> heights of things in that <laughs> yeah. town. So I'm sure that can be done. All right. Sounds Anything good. else on on this item? All right. So again, thanks to everyone. Appreciate your patience and understanding, and uh, to be continued. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, items number 11 and 12 are tabled due to the hour. Item 13 was previously tabled at the request of the applicant. And I'll just, uh, folks, we do have a couple of uh, business items to wrap up as a board, so we just ask if you could move out quietly. Thank you. Item number 14, do we have a staff report? I do have a few. Um, <clears throat> staff report items. Uh, I'm just, folks, if I could just ask you to please uh, try to be quiet and we'll just wrap up our agenda here. Thank you. Uh, talking about site visits, uh, they're in a butter or a public resident <laughs> concerned with <laughs> the horizon. There. What's that? Right. Uh, it's funny how you, at the end, it gets late and it's hard to. It is. People are getting punched. A right. resident concerned with the Verizon Tower uh, suggested the board take a site walk uh, out of the sanitary district site. Um, so I just wanted to sort of gauge the board's um, desire to do that, along with a site visit at a, a proposed subdivision off Sawyer Road that the board reviewed a sketch plan uh, several months back, um, Mark O'Leary's project. So I guess we just wanted to gauge the board's desire to do these site visits before there's too much snow on the ground. If, like, yeah. like before tonight? Yeah, I'm not sure what that <laughs> yeah, means. Is, <laughs> with, with, with another six inches hour. tomorrow, it's, it's already snow getting for two days. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I'd say, you know, conditions and schedules permitting, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. But for both? Yeah. Sure. Okay. That's all what I have tonight. So the will of the board, it's the will of the outgoing chair. So I just want to be sure, because I know in the last couple times we've tried to find site visit times, it's been tricky trying to find scheduling. So if we're committing to it, I want to be sure we're committing to right. it. I'm sorry to put you and on again, the spot as, a little bit, but. And as, and as Jay has pointed out in the past, and staff always reminds us when, when we do that and it, it's posted and it's essentially a form of a public meeting, so it needs to be, uh, you know, we need to be confident that we can make folks it. are, are going to do it. So if we're comfortable with it, that's great. Right. Right. Wait a minute. Which two are we doing then? I want to, now that I'm committing. It'd be the <laughs> Verizon cell tower site. Yeah. Sanitary district. And the uh, proposed subdivision, I think it's 93 Sawyer Road. Yeah. Um, it's right over here at the corner. Yeah. Um, and then also Piper Shores. And Piper Shores. And Dorado Drive. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, yeah, we can. So, if you're comfortable with it, we'll send out our scheduling and find the time that works. And uh, then, then we ought to um, amend the, um, the town's board ordinance and require a chair to hang on for a couple of months. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, while I'm kind of comfortable with it, it's dark awfully early now. Mm -hmm. um, so, it sounds as though the about the only time for a site visit is going to be on a Saturday or a Sunday so that it's in daylight. My only request would be that we don't do all three within, you know, two hours of each other, that um, a couple of them, uh, but I think the Piper Shores is going to take perhaps a little longer. Um, so really set up two separate times. Two separate visits. days, you mean? Yeah. I, and I know that's going to be tougher and tougher as we get into the, the winter. Yeah. I, I mean, just, I don't know if we're all going to take a, take a straw poll or something, but I, you know, the Piper Shores to me to see where those 
buildings are going to be laid out seems to make sense but the tower um, I've already I've been there before and I've seen all the pictures and I'm not sure me standing at the wastewater treatment plant is going to give me any better perspective than I have right now honestly um, and the other one's just a, the other one I should say just a subdivision but is a I'm fairly confident doing a site visit at, is, on that particular one isn't going to change my mind on it either. But um, oh. that's just me. I mean, you can ask Nick and Roger. And I, I might have missed it, but the request for the Sawyer Road one, I, where did that? I'm, I don't know if I missed the meeting. But I don't recall. That's the, that's the one that goes in. I think the engineer got in there. touch with Jamel recently and was asking if yeah. the oh, board wanted to do a site visit. So I don't know. So if it's not necessarily we, the board, requested no. one. We were just invited to one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, until I have a reason, I'm going to pass. <laughs> uh, All right. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, I think uh, like Rick, I would agree that I'm not sure I need to see the cell phone tower site. The sanitary district is. Accessible from yeah. the road. Right? So, <laughs> to the sanitary just I've seen a lot of plans. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a valid point, and I, I think, I think that's not the same thing as saying that the applicant should not be continuing to consider, you know, alternative locations within that area. But, um, well, but wouldn't it be basically know. just going down there and looking at twenty feet into the, into the woods, which is where that's a discussion right now with the tower, right? Right. No, so it's 20 feet. It really has, it's Something really, like yeah, that. I think the, the concern is actually more what you can or can't see from certain vantage points away yeah, from yeah. there. Yeah. My so. general rule of thumb on a site visit is what, what I would, the, the sand pit, great example of this. When I saw plans that showed, you know, basically a 18 foot wall behind somebody's house. So I was like, what the heck is yeah. that? And, you know, you're in the middle of a, a sand pit. So mm -hmm. let's go tell me what you're going to do here because this is interesting. Um, you know, it, the, uh, you know, this this big multi-unit on top of a ridge. I want to see what that looks like. That's something worth yeah. flying a balloon up for. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I don't know if I need to. All right. So Goodbye. I think so. I think we've honed in on really just focusing Piper. on Piper Shores. Piper Shores. Yeah. I'm here. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, administrative amendments. Actually, I do have one other staff comment. Oh, um, okay. We've been trying to schedule our first public meeting on the uh, on the Route One corridor study. Um, we were find, able to find a date. It's going to be on December 13th. Um, so we have another planning board meeting before that, and I'll certainly keep you posted. But I want to sort of get that on your radar screens and. Okay. Uh, we'll be uh, sort of doing some public notices around that and, and such. So, um, just to let you know. Thank you. On the board. <coughs> All right. What time on the 13th, Jay? Uh, I think we were talking about starting around 6 p.m. What day is that? It's a Thursday evening. And I'll, and be I'll, here. I'll, I'll send out additional information on, but in the evening, sort of want to get the date. On right. your radar, as I said. So, any other staff comments? All right. Administrative amendments. Uh, there are none no. uh, this time period. Planning board <laughs> correspondence. No. Okay. Planning board comments. Yes. Yeah, I uh, Jamel and I attended um, a training um, for conservation commission members and. Uh, looking at what planning boards do and the role of the Conservation Commission uh, in working with planning boards. Um, the planning board, the Conservation Commission uh, periodically brings up the question of why don't we as Conservation Commission get to look at everything first or to, um, to weigh in on uh, various developments. Uh, in the course of those consistent and fruitless discussions, um, I started to think about how we really could work with the, the Conservation Commission. I, and what my proposal was to the, the commission, if they were interested, and to bring it here to the planning board, 
is that the members of the Conservation Commission would have access to the Dropbox for any of the um, conservation uh, developments. And that if the Conservation Commission wished to weigh in in terms of comments as a starting off really comments as public rather than on behalf of or in the name of the Conservation Commission, that we would try that to get our voices as a commission heard uh, before the planning board as some of these conservation developments start off. I was very clear with the members of the Conservation Commission that the planning board's under very tight timelines. So if they do want to get something in, if they want to get a comment in about a development, uh, they had basically a week from the time that something went on to the went into the Dropbox or was available um, to the time that they had to get, let's say, to the Friday, following Friday. And if the, the Conservation Commission or the f members of it did not turn in anything, um, we didn't exactly put it with stop complaining, but they did have, um, you know, it was their responsibility or our responsibility since I'm on it to, to make the comments. And we would try that for a while and see if that satisfied uh, the concerns on the Conservation Commission that they might have something to contribute in terms of the thoughts of, of the planning board or to inform the planning board on some areas that we might not be aware of. Uh, and it seems to me if this is something that works and satisfies the needs of folks to, to really express some of their concerns, that that might be then in some way, shape, or form formalized as, a, as part of a process. So we talked about trying it for a year, uh, putting in the comments, and really making an effort to have somebody from the Conservation Commission at least respond uh, to some development that was coming forward. Uh, and if it proved helpful to the planning board and it proved that the Conservation Commission folks could actually adhere to the timelines and really spend some time digging into uh, the developments and, and giving some um, opinions to the planning board and forming some of our deliberations that that might be a good way to go. And that way kind of came out of looking at some of the uh, other towns, how they handled the relationships between the conservation commissions and the planning boards. All right, thank you. I think that's we'll a, see. Yeah, I think that's a good experiment. Oh, uh, and, I had another comment. Yep. I wanted to thank the Public Works Department for weighing in on the the um, the waivers and things. I, I just want to commend Stephen Buckley for doing a really good job of, of, of uh, expressing the intent. Um, the other thing I'd like to also, I guess, understand is um, uh, sort of the whole idea of waivers around um, plan, you know, you know, development and um, uh, you know. I, you know, I have I have times where I need questions answered, like, oh, you know, we we had waivers that were um, that were offered one in one project tonight, and then obviously another um, project had to withdraw. Um, and I apologize, it's 11:30 at night, and I'm trying to be succinct. But anyway, I need help in understanding waivers, and I'm wondering if anybody else is in the same boat. Um, I think that could be a great topic for the workshop that's yeah. going to be held nice workshop. <laughs> yeah. okay. prior to the final uh, uh, planning board meeting <laughs> of the year. But I, I mean, I, I, and I understand what you're saying, and, and I think part of what can be challenging for us sometimes and the public and applicants is that, you know, there, there are, you know, like I said earlier, context matters, and yeah. sometimes there, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, there's a, there are gradations to things, and there, the board does have, does have some discretion. Um, but I, just I see but it as I, a tremendous, you yeah. know, liability, and I don't, I don't want us to ever feel like we're in a position where yeah. it's it, given to one it, and not another. It's as though it's treated as a precedent, yeah. and that because Joe got it, Mike should get it. 
and moving forward, Mike will get it so, again. Yeah. That's not how it's. Yeah, I'll just, this I is 1130, it. I'll talk to <laughs> well, I'll talk. No, no one's going to bed. <laughs> no, so, anybody out there? <laughs> no, just real quick. So, the, in, at the utility and standards, if once we, once you allow something, that's the standard. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, and that's the way it works. So it, it's hard, and it would be nice to have, when we do workshops and stuff or whatever. Like, I, I hated to do that 100 foot radius, but if that's the rule, that's we're going to make it the rule. Let's make it the rule and always follow it. I uh, guess, even to be though we clear, this board doesn't have that same. A waiver is distinct to that project. And we, we'll talk about this at a we'll workshop. Do it, we'll now, do it in a workshop. But, but yeah. to your concern, you don't set precedents right. with your waivers. Now, there may be expectations. Don't get me wrong. I'm you're okay. certainly going to hear it. <laughs> you gave that person this. Why don't I get it? But um, but it's different. But it is different. So. You can make you can do waivers. We, and it doesn't have to be the rule. That's my point. We heard that tonight, okay. which right. was hard. You right. know, yeah. you know, and, and that's and but that's not to say that I yeah. you know. Well, it's good to have that clarification because I was on, I was con I was confused. Well, you know, and there are cleared it up for me. Before so. you started, and there are other examples. Uh, you know, with, well, some uh, there have been projects where we've where we've granted conditional approvals that have pretty pretty long lists of conditions. Yeah. And then there are other cases where, we've, depending on the situation and the nature of those proposed conditions, we've sort of drawn the line and said this is just kind yeah. of too much at this point. So I think that is one of part one of the big nuances of. Being on the board for better or worse, um, but yes, I, I think that's definitely worthy of discussion going forward. And I just have two more comments, and I'll make it brief. I promise. <laughs> the first one is well, we I just really want to I really want to thank Corey <laughs> for he's all he's that he's up. done well, in his ten years for the planning board, and and to think that you only have one more meeting left is is um, is hard. I think for a lot of us, especially since in these areas that are so. That are you know not always black and white. The gray. You do such a good job of Thank guiding you. us, and you. Um, I, I don't know what we're going to do without you. But then the last one I have is. Um, I think we all need updated notebooks. Um, we've made some changes to the ordinances, and I know my notebook needs to be updated. So. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I should have left with. I should have ended on the Cory one. Sorry. <laughs> so, well, what I notice is I when you said he, he, this was, you know, when his <laughs> next last meeting, I saw he, there was a little smile that he had. No, <laughs> no just kidding. Just getting punchy. <laughs> All right, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. Popular. I'm going to move to adjourn. I'll second. Second. Thank you. Thank you.